Okay, so good evening uh, and welcome uh, to General Council uh, of February 8th. Uh, I'll first begin uh, by looking to see and identifying any media on the line. Off uh, Victoria Gray from the Turtle Island News. Good evening, Victoria. Are there any representatives from the Turo Times? Okay, seeing or hearing none, I'll move to the next item, uh, which is any changes, additions, or deletions to the agenda. Uh, Michelle? Can we add um, from yesterday's meeting the, the municipality quashing that rumor? Yes. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, anything further? Tammy? Or can we remove from the agenda the Iroquois caucus um, information? And we're going to move that to political liaison where we'll have more information in a complete package. Is that referring to the um, the nuclear committee, that, that piece? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that. Okay, is there anything further? Okay, seeing or hearing none then, uh, I'll look to a motion to adopt the General Council agenda of February 8th with the addition of Councillor Michelle's uh, and as second. well as Tammy's moved by Audrey, second by Michelle. All in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Okay, we do have a number of delegations this evening. So I just wanna, in terms of uh, keeping uh, an eye on the time, wanna be able to at least give thorough discussion for each. Our first delegation that we have this evening uh, is our Director of Education, Travis Anderson, uh, to provide our, uh, our council and our community with the update and the reopening uh, of the schools. Uh, so with that being said, I'll pass the floor right over to yourself, uh, Travis, to lead us through uh, the updates. Now, now of that, uh, Chief Mark, I'm going to start my screen. I'm going to take over the screen here, if you don't mind. And I just have a PowerPoint. Are you still on? Can you, can you see that, Chief? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Uh, I want well, to start with just saying yawa to the students, parents, uh, staff, and community for their patience and understanding under these extremely challenging and difficult times. Uh, as you know, today is day uh, 699 of the, of the pandemic on Six Nations. So, uh, so I'm excited to, to announce the return to full in-person learning on February 14th, 2022. Um, the return to full in-person learning is supported by the Six Nations Incident Management Team. Uh, after a fulsome discussion and based on current evidence, uh, schools are not deemed the highest risk setting. So with that today, I just wanted to quickly, I don't want to take too much time, but I'll go over the, the layers of safety measures that we have in place. The Virtual Academy, which is also an option uh, uh, um, if you're not doing the in-person, uh, full in-person learning and also some more important information on just little, pretty much reminders. And then also we've invited Lacey Benibri from the Shrieking Public Health to assist if there's any questions uh, at the end. So with that, move. I, I've already sent, oh, I went too fast. Uh, I've sent a letter home with, uh, with the parents already, um, kind of indicating all the layers of protection that we have in place at the federal schools. You know, each school has been assigned a school nurse yeah. Uh, federal schools are in compliance with the Ministry of Education guidelines for mechanical ventilation and air quality tests have been uh, conducted. Uh, there's three ply medical masks uh, for all students uh, with also the option of a canine masks for, for students as an option. All staff members will have the option of N95 masks. Um, so you just see the layers and layers of protection because there is no one, one thing that prevents COVID and it, it's layers of, uh, of pr protection. Uh, we also have the plexiglass uh, dividers. They're used uh, for students during mass breaks and nutrition breaks. Um, schools will continue to promote outdoor learning and reporting COVID positive cases will continue within the school community. 
Uh, and again, we'll be working in collaboration with uh, Oshawa Public Health and also the IMT team. So if you're not returning to full in-person learning, there's still an option. Uh, there's the virtual academy. Um, we'll, we'll be doing that through our Edmodo shells. Um, attendance uh, will be taken daily with students. Uh, you know, they'll be required to, for daily Zoom lessons uh, with their teachers. Uh, currently, right now, we have 44 students out of uh, 1,050 approximately students uh, at the federal schools. 44 have registered so far. Uh, along with that, um, registration and information has been sent to parents uh, on a few occasions, and we've continued to move the deadline. Uh, and the same will go here. You know, we, we had a deadline of uh, uh, last week, last Thursday, but um, that's just to help do to get some of the numbers to structure our, our planning. Uh, so you can see the programs and the Haudenosaunee language and culture, uh, expectations for students, and then the, you know the considerations of, of go moving to an online learning instead of the in-person learning. So there's some consideration. So uh, these flyers went out to parents. Um, they've been shared and they're at the schools. If uh, parents want them now, they can contact the schools and uh, they can be sent to them either email or, or picked up. Uh, along with that, there, you know, there, there will be challenges with us uh, moving to in-person learning. Um, one is, is we may run into staffing issues, uh, being able to keep uh, certified teachers in the classroom. Uh, we hope that that doesn't happen. Um, I, uh, we have seven, seven o'clock as kind of a cutoff uh, for parents to check their Edmodo shells and face uh, and Facebook uh, from each school. They'll be at that time putting out any closures of the classroom. If a classroom may have to move uh, online uh, remotely, if we can't put a staff member in front of the students, but we did. We did try to plan for that and we hired additional staff, um, but the, there is staff shortages uh, in all the schools right now, but uh, we, we did hire a few more. Um, the next piece uh, is it's important to have the contact information for the schools, uh, for the families in the emergency contacts. So having that uh, is important. Uh, the next piece would, would be that uh, if, if one sibling's ill in the family, that all siblings are staying home. Um, if a sibling shows up at school, has symptoms, <clears throat> the whole family will, will, be, a, will be sent home. Um, rapid testing is available, <clears throat> are, are available from, from the school and will be sent home with students. Uh, we actually have rapid testing for staff that they can take home on every Friday with five tests, tests before they come to work, option. And then also still that uh, symptomatic students, they can also arrange a PCR um, as the assessment center, and there's the number there. And then we also have our, um, if you're una unable to attend school, you're ill and there's COVID uh, protocols in place, you can always log in through your Edmodo shell and, and learn asynchronously um, through through the, that time that there's isolation. If there's a classroom that's uh, closed down and, and the class has to go remote, um, then they'll be logging into their Edmodo and they'll be doing, doing some live lessons through their Zooms on the Edmodo shell. It will be look very similar to what it looked like in cohorts through September to December. Uh, kind of the same protocols are, are still in place, um, but now we're just returning to full mm. person learning. But it's, the next part is really important that uh, parents aren't sending students to school. That if they're, if they're ill, they're not passing the screening, then uh, they're keeping them home. And uh, we may have same issues with, with busing. Um, as you know, there's a shortage for, for staff at the uh, various jobs and, and one is gonna potentially could be the busing. So if buses are closed or a classroom is closed for the day, these things will be announced by 7 a.m. To, to the parents through their Edmodo shells on Facebook. Uh, so I did invite, uh, so our plan and, and our steps forward is, uh, has the support of uh, Sweden Public Health and the IMT team. Um, so they'll be supporting the, the Six Nations Federal Schools and, and with a school nurse at each school, it's going to be, um, they'll be vital in that communication piece on reporting our, our COVID our, our COVID cases. Uh, they're going to be publicly um, announced on our on the Six Nations uh, COVID website. And then all families, if there's a case within the school, they'll be receiving a letter uh, that there are low risk and then the high risks would be contacted through uh, school nurses in collaboration with the street and public health. So the, those, the protocols that we had in place in, in from September to December are, are very similar to what it'll look like for a full person in learning. 
And I'll turn over to Shreegan Public Health if Lacey's on, if there's anything that she want to add. I didn't miss, I, I did cover quite a bit. Is there anything you want to add, Lacey? Thanks, Travis. Um, yeah, just in terms of the vaccination rates, we still have low rates for students entering back into the school. So that's one consideration when parents are sending their kids back. Um, other than that, you know, just really encouraging individuals to seek vaccination. We are offering clinics um, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturdays here at Ashwigan Public Health. So we to drop in no appointment needed and we are vaccinating those five years and up so anyone if you're interested just come on over so now yeah, yeah, well, let's see I'll turn okay. it back over. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Walking us through uh, the update in your presentation, Travis and Lacey. Uh, I'm going to now open the floor up for any questions or comments uh, for either of them. I see uh, Michelle. Hey, one comment, one question. Um, so I was chatting with some students and I just want to ensure that students will get those breaks, those because it's my understanding they'll be wearing masks the entire day, right? And I know last time um, some weren't given breaks. So that's been put into their daily routine, correct? Yes, yeah, that is uh, that is correct. The mask breaks should be throughout the day and multiple times. And depending on age that they should be having uh, more, uh, the younger the, the age, probably the more mask breaks. <laughs> And if there's ever an uh, incident where you, your child wasn't getting a math, mask break, then uh, reach out reach out to the teacher, reach out to the school and make yeah. contact. Thanks, Travis. Next thing is, is I know the full council received an email in regards to um, a parent indicating that their student needed additional support. So we know, and I even brought this up when COVID first started, is what are we doing for students? Um, we know we have students who are gonna graduate into high school um, are they academically ready? Um, what is Indigenous Services doing to ensure all our students are moving along? Yes, uh, with that, we hired uh, extra teachers, uh, floaters to help get us into back to in-person learning because that's going to be an important piece is, is being back in the classroom and, and that learning uh, uh, in person is, is far greater than online. Um, with that, they would be allowed, or having the extra staff in the school would be able to support um, any students with, the, with the, their needs and resource and literacy and, and math uh, numeracy. So there's each school is developing a recovery plan and we're not the, the only board or, or only school system that is uh, um, behind and, and missed time in substantial amounts of time. So uh, each school will be working hard uh, with the recovery plan for the uh, literacy and numeracy skills for the students for sure. I hope that answered your question. I think just, just also really quickly, also further to add, we did have the opportunity uh, to meet with Ann Scott in uh, on this uh, matter as well. And I believe we'll be doing further follow-up from some of those discussion points. Travis obviously was uh, involved in that meeting uh, as well, just to further along uh, the, you know, the, the types of concerns that have been coming in from parents and the additional support required and needed uh, for especially those moving on to the next step, uh, high school and so forth. Uh, you know, we want, the last thing we wanna do is, is um, you know, set our, our kids up for failure. Uh, you know, so we know that there is education gaps uh, that have occurred since COVID. So uh, we are looking to still continue to look at those discussion points that were raised at that meeting as well. Yeah, what's your no problem. Is there any uh, further questions or comments? There is a comment in the chat, Chief. Uh, yeah, I'm just seeing that. Thanks for that, Michelle. So just a comment in the chat. Has the outdoor temperature guideline that in the past uh, has been deemed too cold to be outside been adjusted to ensure students are allowed, aren't are allowed to be outside? Yes, we, we had the discussions at uh, PAC and we've uh, I've reached out to Lacey. She's working on getting more information on, on seeing those cold, cold, cold weather alerts uh, at what temperature the, you know, those are issued because um, that's usually what we follow is that guidance from Michigan Public Health. 
So uh, we are following up with that. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Uh, are there any further questions or comments? Okay, I'm seeing or hearing none then. I, there is a recommendation that just reads to accept the verbal update by Travis Anderson, our Director of Education, Indigenous Services Canada, and also to confirm the reopening of the federally operated day uh, schools located on Six Nations of the Grand River Territory effective February 14th. Um, uh, is there a mover moved Audrey. by Audrey Seconder? Is there a seconder to the motion? Second by Michelle. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none then, all in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none motion is carried. A motion to waive second reading. I waive, Audrey. Moved by Audrey, second by Michelle. All in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Well, thank you, Nyawa, so much, uh, Travis, for, for joining us this evening and providing uh, our council and our community with the update on, on schools. Uh, and again, I wish all of our students uh, you know, a healthy return back to those that are attending in person, that is. Uh, and again, to all of our, our families, educators, you know, this is, again, still unprecedented times, and we're trying our best as we continue to move forward here. Uh, and during these times. So appreciate you joining us, Travis uh, and Lacey, uh, and look forward to our next steps here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, well, have a good have a good evening. Okay, oh, Council, that leads us into our next uh, delegation, uh, which is the Six Nations Sports and Cultural Memorial Center delegation. I know this item has been on the agenda for some time uh, now, and I do uh, just want to confirm uh, as well, uh, Councillor Audrey, if we can put her in the waiting room as she's uh, declared conflict. Um, and then we'll look to pass the floor over to, I believe, uh, speaking on behalf of the delegation uh, is Michael Montour Sr., uh, who I believe also has some guests joining him this evening uh, that will also be uh, speaking. I do also just really quickly want to uh, recognize the time of things. We generally give about 20 minutes, maximum maybe 30 minutes to each delegation. So just wanna make sure that we uh, stay within that time limit. Uh, so with that being said, I wanted to say welcome uh, you, uh, Michael, and others who are joining uh, the delegation, uh, and I'll pass the floor right over to yourself, Michael. Unmuted. Sego, sego, guego. Hello to all of you. Galoniago ne Youngyats, they call me de Galoniago. Ne Saga, Michael Montour, or Saluni. This English is Michael Montour. Um, Genyegeha niwa gohonjodo. I'm part of the Moha Earth. Anoala niwa gita lodo. I'm part of the turtle clay. Wagas noni go igas. I'm happy to be here. Ayama sa sewa dot galide dot nu. Sewatsa nuni. I hope all of you are healthy and happy. Yeah, so. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about Vera Steyer's and then I wanna have a moment of silence. And then uh, I'm going to ask Brenda Johnson to, to do uh, a little bit of speaking for us. So uh, Vera Steyer's, um, her nickname was the mother of the arena and she was our leader. She was the mother of the arena since 1969. Uh, my dad, started the arena, my dad, Joe Montour, and uh, Welby uh, Johnson was, was uh, helping my dad. And then we, they went and got Vera. Vera came out of her school to be a secretary. And uh, so those are the three people that started our arena in 1969. And all the community came to help and built that arena for free. And in 1972, it opened up and started having uh, games and, all that kind of thing. So this is the 50th anniversary for our arena this year. It'd be nice to see a nice celebration at Bread and Cheese because we had a grand opening at Bread and Cheese. I don't know with COVID, we don't know. Nobody knows what's gonna happen. But anyway, um, I just wanna start with a moment of silence for Vera Steyer's. And then I'm gonna, and after a, that moment, I'm gonna call on Brenda Johnson. So can we have that moment of silence now, please?
Nyawa for, for uh, respecting uh, Vera Steyer's, um, what a great leader in our community for so long. Um, I had a lot of talks with Vera the last three years. I've been working on this uh, arena. Ever since I found out what happened to our arena, I've been, I've been working on it for three years now. I talk to Vera all the time. And uh, my presentation, Vera usually uh, helps me. So uh, I'm gonna dedicate this meeting to Vera tonight. And uh, Brenda, if you wanna uh, do your thing now, please. Oh, so, sorry, Brenda, just want to, you're still on mute. Sorry. There you go. Okay, so um, I just, I wanted to um, explain why the name of the arena meant so much to Vera. Um, she passed away on the 24th of January and in going through some stuff with like her papers and stuff we come across we come across her her day school and one of the things that really changed the way that she thought of herself in a sense of um the negative aspect of what the residential schools put in place and that indigenous people were no good no good for nothing and lazy and dirty and um and building this being part of this creation and the building of the arena and all the meetings and fundraising and she was a secretary and um she helped make the phone calls to keep everybody informed and attend meetings so she put a lot of her heart into it and her kids when they were young, having to travel travel to other communities late at night because they couldn't get um, decent um, time on the floor at, for their their children because they had to wait for everybody else's uh, teams in the community in the out outlying communities to have their time on their for their practice and stuff. So the idea of building it was to benefit all of our children then and future like we we know 50 years it's been our families have been enjoying that so one of the things that changed when she went off to school when she was about 50 while well, graduating from university she would talk about what our community did when you come together and you work together and you put in your time and your effort for the benefit of everyone. And that day that it was the opening that Mike talked about was the day that it changed that belief that she had about being a dirty, good for nothing Indian. And that for her, that collaboration and effort and blood, sweat and tears of everybody who contributed to that that memory changed and she never thought of herself as that because of what everybody was able to do together and the name of it was to honor the community as a whole and it wasn't to be one person's identity put on that put on that building it was meant for everyone everyone who plays sports everyone who enjoys sports and the um the cultural part was for the culture that as Haudenosaunee people that we have as a community that we have and the memorial part was to recognize all of the veterans who have gone to war who have yet um served in the military yeah. So it was very important for her for the arena to be um, remain the Six Nations Sports and Cultural Memorial Center because it was representative of our 
our people who are gone now, like Mike's dad and so many others, Bira now, it was very important to her right up until she passed. It was something that she had wanted returned to its original name. So that's all I have. Thank you for listening. Nyawa, Brenda. That was awesome, Brenda. Nyawa. And uh, so next we have uh, Dave General with us. He's going to say uh, a few words here, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll say a few words after that. Okay, Dave. <laughs> there you go, Council Chief. Chief here? <laughs> oh, there. Okay, good. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, having this meeting, and thank you, Mike, for uh, informing me and, and allowing me to tag along. Mm -hmm. I have a brand new computer at home, but my daughter forgot got to plug in the uh, Zoom number for me, so I had to chase around and find my cup at Brantford. <laughs> anyway, the the reason I'm here is just to to uh, underscore a lot of what Brenda has said. Uh, that's my main reason is that I knew a lot of the people who were supporters of the of the council. Uh, the one who mentioned things a lot every time I saw him was Councillor Bill White, and uh, and then there were a whole number of people who uh, were support supporters. I met some of the people who worked on the construction of the uh, of the uh, the arena. Some guys who went and got the steel and uh, refabricated it for for the arena. And uh, we needed that because I I knew so many of our our lacrosse players and hockey players who had to leave our territory to go and play the sport that they loved and. Uh, Having the arena in our territory gave their friends and families, uh, gave them somebody to cheer for. Um, I was a teacher for for a little while, and uh, my involvement with the uh, with the uh, the arena was uh, uh, helping my mom, who was a teacher, and my sister, who was a teacher, uh, go set up the fair. And for the longest time, it was just the community center, and then. Um, and then they built the arena and a lot of uh, a lot of the events and the, the materials uh, spilled over into the uh, into the uh, the arena. Uh, we've all gone to uh, bread and cheese, and I remember uh, time uh, times when uh, when I was just a normal citizen that I, I helped out with bread and cheese, and then uh, uh, when I was chief for a, a, a few years. Uh, um, mine was the line where people came through and uh, always they didn't ask for it. they said I want a bigger piece of cheese so um, those are some of the the community uh, things I can remember of the um, so this meeting say that again Oh, apologies, uh, Dave. I believe someone just went on, on off of mute, so they're back on mute. The floor is back over oh, to you. Okay, okay. Um, my biggest involvement at the uh, at the uh, the arena is uh, lacrosse. I spent eighteen years as a as a community lacrosse coach in the minors. And, uh, <coughs> proud proud to say that the Six Nations uh, Sports and Cultural Memorial Arena was the home base for. A uh, group of young guys that I had the, the ple pleasure and joy of working with. Uh, we spent hours and hours in in, the, in that arena, and uh, I guess you can say the the benefits that those players got led them to. Uh, they had three Ontario A titles, and uh, many of them went on to have four uh, national national titles, five national titles. One was in the minors. It was a Bantam, Bantam A national title, uh, 92. Uh, ours was the first indigenous team to uh, win the Minto Cup, which is uh, emblematic of the, the finest junior A team in all of Canada. And uh, many went on to use uh, Six Nations Arena as, uh, as the major uh, venue for uh, the Six Nation Chiefs who were three-time 
consecutive Man Cup uh, championships for Canada. And, and again, um, both uh, players from our community and so many, so many non-Indigenous players that came to our community love that arena. They love being here. They love coming to play with guys, uh, you know, a few years earlier where they were beating on each other just because of the toughness of, of the sport. So um, many, many lacrosse players enjoyed, enjoyed our arena. So I, I'm basically here to, um, well, well, I'll share with you that I, I was on the council when the family came there and I, that was, it was absolutely heartbreaking to, to, to get the news and, um, and, and council, council made the decision there. I, I'll, I'll be honest and say, I, I did not vote for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, the matter that was before us. And again, it goes back to that reason about that it was uh, never to be named anything else than, than the Six Nations Sports and Memorial, uh, Sports and Cultural Memorial Arena. Um, I guess the last thing I, I'll share with you and, and I hope for is, I hope the decision to rename it becomes very, very broad and inclusive of all the community. I, um, I love what's called uh, propositions where say during an election, uh, I see in the state sometimes they bring out things that have to come before the community and they're put into propositions with purposes and timelines and, and all of that. And a large, large group of people who are interested in the matter, they make the vote. And I'll suggest that uh, maybe bread and cheese is a good time to, uh, to do a, a referendum on, on the decision. So it, it comes down to not being just the council, to, to make that decision, uh, not just to be, uh, you know, the, the uh, elected council or the traditional council to make that decision, but all of the people of Six Nations of the Grand River. And, uh, you know, with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you very much for uh, uh, having me provide words to this, uh, to this uh, discussion and, uh, I look forward to the results that uh, come from our, our discussions. <clears throat> yeah, well, Dave, uh, good job. That was a good job by Dave General. Pro probably the win winningest lacrosse coach that I know for sure. Um, I looked up, up to him for a long time and uh, he helped me when I coached the Arrows for five years. We had a lot of phone calls. We even drove to Whitby one time and I got to the speak with the great Jimmy Bishop, who was coaching Whitby at that time. And uh, we went there because St. Catharines and Whitby were playing and, uh, and St. Catharines beat them. It was an upset game seven. And then we beat St. Catharines. That was 98 when uh, the Arrows, we won uh, Ontario and went out west for the Minnow Cup. But Dave showed me, he was there that night and he showed me how to write down where everybody was standing at the face-offs and showing me uh, the power play that St. Catharines had and their penalty killing. and what guy does what? Like he taught me so much that just that one night when we traveled to Whitby to watch that game seven. And uh, I use them skills still today when I coach. I, I remember what Dave told me and so important to get that ball and get the face offs and you got to have the right guys in the right place. And there's a lot to it. There's a lot of strategy <laughs> that I didn't know until Dave taught me. So I always called him up when we were in the playoffs and stuff and he helped me over the years and Appreciate it that he come to help again tonight. Um, he's uh, uh, one of the real leaders in our community and uh, glad that he could make it. He, like, like he said, he had to come and find me in Brantford. Like we were texting and talking on the phone for about an hour ago, trying to figure out how to get him here. But he, he found us anyway, that's good. <laughs> I was getting worried. He just got here in the nick of time. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> My uh, my thing is going to be a screen share. I, I put a bunch of my ideas on uh, on the screen share, so I'm just going to like read it to you, I suppose. And uh, <clears throat> okay, so there's uh, what I got. I sent this to council already. Um, this is my three years of research on this topic. Um, 
this is what I came up with uh, the top 12 reasons for only having the Six Nations Sports and Culture Memorial Center name on the front of our Schwiegen Arena. So I'm just going to read through these and then we can have some questions and answers uh, at the end. So um, uh, number one, the 1970 elected band council with Chief Richard Isaacs held a referendum vote with an estimated cost of 60,000, which was won by our people to build an arena with our original name, Six Nations Sports and Culture Memorial Center. So there was already a referendum and uh, there's records of that. Um, so that's what our people wanted and the elected council uh, agreed to it. And so that was uh, one of the first things had to be done to build the arena. Uh, we had to make sure that everybody wanted to do it. And uh, so that was the start of uh, four years of building the arena and uh, mostly on the weekends too. Like we all work uh, Monday to Friday, but these, these guys, all these volunteers and their wives, and they, they all uh, worked on the weekends for four years to get our arena. And they never, it was hard because they never had a lot of money. So they'd build a little bit and they'd have to quit and fundraise and build and make some more money and build a little bit more. So it's quite a story. Anyway, uh, number two, there was a conflict of interest because two of the 2001 elected band council members were the individuals who made the motions to change the name of our arena to the name of a family member. So a lot of people don't know that, but what we are here for tonight is because of a conflict of interest. This is the consequences of a conflict of interest where family um, makes uh, motions to help their own family. And um, that's why we're here today. 21 years later, we're still trying to fix this because our name was taken away. <clears throat> so we're not the villains. Um, you know, we are the victims. Um, because we lost our name and we didn't do anything wrong. I don't know why, why would you ever take that away from the people? So that's why we're here. Number three, there were iron workers and other volunteer workers for a total of 72 people with various skills who helped with the construction of our Six Nations Arena while only Gaylord Powell's is being recognized for the building of our community arena. So, <clears throat> So that, that's, uh, it's not our way to recognize one person. And uh, we're all six nations and uh, we're all supposed to be together. We're supposed to work together. And that's what they did to build the arena, all these six nations people and uh, all kinds of skills, not just iron workers, but they were important, very important. But we had uh, different ones that helped out. Number four is a big one here, number four, Ambrose Johnson and Mick Hill made the expensive blueprint print drawings for free. Our Six Nations Arena would never have been built without these important documents to show the way for our construction workers. So Ambrose, uh, he's amazing. Uh, Welby still has them blueprints. He brought them to a meeting, they're, they're awesome. There was a lot of cutbacks because they were supposed to be at the entrance there. There was supposed to be like a community hall upstairs. And uh, it was a lot of extras that we couldn't afford. Um, so that was important. Ambrose Johnson, that was awesome that he did that for free, those blueprints. And Mick Hill was helping. I guess where they work, they, they, they uh, allowed him to do that. And so that's amazing because you can't do anything, you can't build a house or anything without them kind of blueprints. And it's expensive. Number five. I found 134 Six Nations community members who made donations or they helped with the following fundraising events, a car auction, a house draw, dances, raffles, bingo games, a walkathon, 50-50 draws, band jamborees, and crowns and acres. You know, uh, Vera told me she spent $40,000 of, of her own money over four years to build our arena. Because you think about it, somebody's got to rent the hall, somebody's got to, you know, uh, arrange things. Vera, Vera, I said, what was your job, Vera? And she said, oh, I was at the meetings all the time and taking my notes. And she said, people would say, oh, I'll do this, I'll do that. 
And uh, she said, I'd had to follow up. I had to go and see them. If it wasn't getting done, I went to see them. Like, why aren't you doing, you know, why aren't you here on your work? And you said, you're going to help. Like, that's a hard job. And that's what Vera did. And she made, uh, made sure everything's got done. And uh, here she was a single mother. She was a widow with five kids. And she did that for, uh, for us. She did it for us, for our kids. So it's amazing. And all these things, that house across from Jameson School, that was in the draw. Somebody won that house. And that was part of the fundraising. Victor Porter brought a car. He was a car salesman. He brought a car and they, they auctioned that off and made money. Like there's so much that was done, you know, for our kids. It's all for our kids. This, it's, it's sad that we're, we're uh, in a disagreement here because this is for our kids. So uh, I'm going to go on to number six. Uh, Jake Thomas and Hubert, Hubert Buck Sr., along with Sadie Buck's native singers, negotiated for a grant based on the culture word in the name of our Six Nations Arena. Jake Thomas completed this grant by getting a promise that the Six Nations Sports and Culture Memorial Center name would never be changed. So there was a lot of grants uh, based on the name of our arena. <clears throat> so it's important, I think it's important to know that the, uh, a lot of Confederacy people were involved. Jake Thomas, uh, Hubert Buck Sr., Hubert Sky was involved. Arnold Jacobs did incredible work, all that artwork. He did all that artwork for free, inside and out. And he even um, assembled the letters. I see, thank, I thank you very much, uh, Council, for putting our name back on the arena. Shortly after Christmas, I noticed that. Six Days in Sports and Culture Memorial Center. Arnold Jacobs said, I put that name up there by myself when we first, the very first time when we did that in, in like 72. So that's incredible that what he did. And uh, he's a Confederacy chief too. So it's amazing. The Confederacy was helping. We were all together. Whether you were a Confederacy or church or whatever you did, we were together. And that arena was built by our people for free. With all, they found all the materials. You'll never ever see another arena built like that. And uh, it's the only time in the history that that has ever been done. Our own people. Like we just fought by fundraising and everybody helping out. So this is an amazing story. We, it should be a TV show or something or a book. <laughs> somebody, should, somebody should be on this and I'll help you because I got all kinds of information. <laughs> so, okay, number seven. Mel Squire donated the gravel from his gravel pit, which is a huge savings for our Six Nations Arena builders. Also a special mention to the following community members in alphabetical order for their important contributions towards the building of our Six Nations Arena. Bill and Nina Burnham, Cease Davis, Norma and Russell Davis, Walter Woody Green, Freddie and Terry General, Doris and Sidney Henhop, Minnie and Willie Henhop, Jack Hill, Joyce and Larry Hill, Rusty Isaacs, Arnold Jacobs, Welby Johnson, Paul Lickers, Bill and Maurice McDonald, Dolly and Willie Miller, Mike Miller, Steve Miller, Annette and Joe Montour, Wendy and Bill Montour, Don and Ron Montour, Victor Porter, Eugene P. Smith, Roly Smith, Vera Styers, Butch Thomas, Seymour Thomas, Alton Venebri, William H. White and Gloria and Bill Williams. These are only some of the families who built our Six Days of Sports and Culture Memorial Center. Special thanks to the many others who helped with the construction of our Six Nations Arena. My apologies to anyone that I, that I missed. So we're gonna keep going. So all those people worked hard. Iron workers were part of it. But there were so many other people, donations. My mother and a lot of the wives, they went house to house to get money from people to build an arena. And uh, hard to mention my mom because she, she cries when we talk about this. She says, all, all I wanted to do was help. And all I could do was go door to door and ask for money, she said. And she did. And some people like Dave Smith, he gave $250. So some people really helped a lot just by giving money. So it wasn't just if you could work or what, it was what you could help with. 
it was a whole different generation of people back in 1969. And I still talk to a lot of them. I had a great co conversation with Ron Montour yesterday. And I see he joined up. So good for you, Ron. He's doing pretty good. So uh, I enjoy, I've enjoyed these three years visiting with our elders. Willie Hanock, I had an amazing visit with Willie. And uh, it's really good that they're still here. They're, they're great people. And their families are great too. This is a great community. So number eight, the Six Nations Sports and Culture Memorial Center name was secretly changed by the 2001 elected band council to the Gaylord Palace Arena without involving our Six Nations community members. So I don't think it's right for a small group of people to show up at council and change something. Our arena was there for 29 years from 72 to 2001. Our arena was a proud home, home field for us. And all of a sudden, a day later, it's the Gaylord Powell's Arena. Like, how did that happen? How could, our, how could a group of our leaders um, go against the community? Like, we built that arena, blood, sweat, and tears, lots of hard work. And all of a sudden, it's gone, taken away. Like, like I said, we're not, we're not the villains here. We're the victims. Our arena was taken away from us. So that's why we're still here 21 years later. I just heard about this story three years ago. That's why I'm, I didn't start this job till three years ago because that's when I found out about it. And I was absolutely devastated. The first place I went the day after that meeting, I went right down to the Confederacy and I told them about it. And the Confederacy is behind us 100%. I was there at number 12 school with they were all there, all the chiefs, and they were, they were just as upset as I am. So there's a lot of people that are affected by that. This, that was a, a split second decision by council to change our, take our name off the arena. How can they do that in a split second? Like that's so important. <laughs> Number, okay, we're gonna go on. Number nine. What am I doing for time? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Okay, I think I'm on number nine. It's extremely confusing that our Six Nations arena has been given the name of a lacrosse player who never played at Six Nations. When so many of us have made tremendous sacrifices for many years, registrations, equipment, gas, car repairs, motel rooms, to support our family members who were involved with helping to represent our Six Nations lacrosse, hockey, figure skating, as well as other teams. I remember watching uh, Cat Bumbry's Rumball players in there. That was a pretty wild sport, that broom ball. So uh, yeah, a lot of us, a lot of us gave our lives to that arena. I played for 44 years, lacrosse and hockey, and I co I've been coaching for 40 years now, mostly lacrosse and hockey, but whatever the school had, whatever school teams. So it's a lot to coach. It's a lot to coach. It's hard. And you spend a lot of your own money Every lacrosse season, I probably spent 10 grand, at least my own money. And I was poor. I had to make a lot of sacrifices. My family went, went, went without so I could go and coach. So it's not easy. So number 10, there are 679 families with elementary school students at Six Nations. This is a quote from Kathleen Manderville, former veter federal director of schools two row times. Wednesday, October, uh, August 12th, sorry. So where this number comes from is Kathleen, before Travi, Travi Anderson's our boss now, but be, before him and Kathleen was there. And that's how many packages, work packages they had to, had to put together for all the schools here, like JC Hill, Jameson, IL, Emily C, and OM Smith. So well, that's how many uh, work packages we had to put together so a lot of us don't have elementary school students. So you got to figure there's over 700 families on the reserve. So the only way to, to promote unity and equality amongst all of us is to have only the Six Nations Sports and Culture Memorial Center name on the front of our Six Nations arena. Because there's so many of us, how can one person be chosen to represent us or 
have their name on the arena. Like there's so many of us and we're all supposed to be equal. To Songoyang Diso, we're made from Songoyang Diso. We're all supposed to be the same, equal. And that's how, how it used to be. Our people were so nice with each other and they helped each other. And uh, we need to get back to that as best we can. Number 11 here. Our community completed a survey about the name of our Six Nations Arena from the fall of 2019 to the summer of 2021. Thanks very much to the restaurants, stores, hair salons, and community members who helped with the gathering of our data. We found five, I don't know if you can see this, probably not. We found 512 community members who only want the Six Nations Sports and Culture Memorial Center name on the Six Nations Arena. I'm only aware of seven community members who want the Gaylord Paulus Arena name to stay on the front of our Six Nations Arena. So it's not even close. When I started doing my survey, if every, if every other person was telling me, oh, I want Gaylord's name on the arena, I would have stopped. I, do, I didn't want to divide our community, but it's not that way at all. I'd say over 99% of us in our community want only the Six Nations Sports and Culture Memorial Center name on our arena. And that's, uh, I, I spent three years finding that out. So I know when I came to council before, that was one of the main things. I heard a, lot, a few times I heard from counselors, oh, well, just as many people want Gaylord's name on the arena. That's not true. That's not true at all. It's probably just his siblings who will say that in, in his family. It, and it's, it's not fair and it's not right. So that's why we're here to fix it and go back to the original way. Nothing like the old ways. Number 12 here. Our Six Nations community members are offering a compromise to show respect towards the Gaylord Paulus family. We were requesting for the Gaylord Paulus name to be moved from the front of our Six Nations arena to a dressing room door. Period. The, the Iroquois lacrosse arena has established this way of recognizing our lacrosse players by placing the names of four lacrosse legends on dressing room doors at the Iroquois lacrosse arena. So what I wanna do is I want to put a motion forward. I move for council to come to a resolution with regards to only having the Six Nations Sports and Culture Memorial Center name on our Ashwigan Arena. Also, to have the Gaylord Paulus name moved from the front of our arena to a dressing room door to encourage our native values of, of equality and community unity. So now we could open up for questions and answers. I'm not sure about the time, but... Um, yeah, we'll do that for that. <laughs> All right, well, well now, uh, now uh, Mike, uh, for uh, presenting us uh, with this item again. I know it's been back and forth multiple times for some time now. As you've mentioned, you've been working on this item for three years. Uh, my last, and I, I want to check in, I, I believe I did see Cheryl Henhock on the line. Is Cheryl on the line, just to confirm? Yes, Chief, I'm here. Okay, I just wanted to confirm because I know last at last meeting, and this is what originally I thought in the council that this item was settled. Uh, we had again went back and forth uh, on this piece, um, and that we had made uh, a motion, and the latest motion that it was carried out and actionized by our director of Parks and Rec. So I just wanted to check in with Cheryl just to confirm on that action in and the last motion. Yeah, so we were just, when we discussed this back in the fall of uh, 2021, uh, we were, the council decided at that time to follow the 2019 resolution that was passed by council, which was to maintain both names on the arena. Uh, so that's what was, so that's what, why the uh, Six Nations Sports and Cultural Memorial Center went back up on, on the uh, front, the high, high roof of the uh, arena. Okay, so thanks. we're just thanks, following Cheryl. up on that 2019. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, so as it currently stands, the Six Nations Sports and Cultural Memorial Center is on top of the front of the arena. Excuse me. Excuse Thank me, you. Chief Hill. Thanks for that. Sure. Sorry, I'm just going to go to further questions or comments. I know Councillor Michelle had her heads raised. I'm yeah. going to go over to Michelle and then over to Helen. Thanks, Chief. And first, I want to extend my condolences, Brenda, to you, your family 
I know uh, Vera was uh, well involved. And, and, you know, thanks, Mike, for sharing the history. And again, my understanding was this was dealt with back in the old council. It came back to this council and the name change has happened. Uh, I don't know that uh, I'm actually at, at a loss at why it's back again, because it's my understanding the name has been put back onto the arena and it should stay on the arena. Okay, thank you, uh, Michelle, for your comments. Uh, over to you, Helen. Sorry, Helen, you're on mute. Hard to find. Um, I think because I think it's obvious from Mike's the number of people that have signed his uh, petition or survey what he had, and the number of people that have. If you read his 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 points, his twelve points, the people aren't satisfied with the answer that council made in two thousand nineteen. You know, council resolutions aren't written in stone. And I'm going to go along with Dave General. Well, weird that I'm agreeing with Dave General, but <laughs> I agree with Dave General that I think we need to get hold of community referendum once and for all and get this over with. And I think that's the only way we can resolve it because it's not right for council to be making these kinds of decisions. As Mike said, it's, it should, the council back in the day should never have done that. And I remember Carl Hill telling us the only reason they voted to do putting Gaylor's name on the arena was because they had come there two days before he died asking to do that. And they, you know, they hated, they didn't want to say no. So that's why they agreed to it. So that wasn't even right there. They should have never made that kind of a decision under those kinds of circumstances, but they did. And then Mike came back to the 2019 council and they agreed with leaving it there, but then there's council making a decision again. When we should have done back in 2019, held a referendum and got it over with, but we didn't. So I think that's what we need to do. We need to do a referendum and just settle it once and for all, and then it won't come back. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Thanks, Helen, uh, for your comments as well. You know, and I, I too also just re really quickly want to send uh, my condolences. I know Brenda has her hand raised. I'm going to go over to Brenda and back over to Mike, Mike after this. Uh, but want to send my also my condolences and thoughts and prayers to uh, to uh, your family, uh, Vera. The the other thing that I think is important here to recognize, and I know Mike, you've laid this out very clearly, is you know the community came together to build this. We need the community to come together even more so now. I mean, that's the frustrating part that I have with this, you know, is at, at most, like, you know, we're talking about a name change of an arena that doesn't, and I recognize the importance of it and the pieces and, and, and the history. I, I mean, I think this issue has been back and forth enough for us to understand the, the context behind the issue. However, it just gets frustrating for me to constantly have you know, questions from counselors why this is back on the agenda because of the fact of uh, there's displeasure on, on the last decision. However, I, I feel that you know, with this even being said back when you put it in the context of what we're currently dealing with as a community uh, like COVID, and However, the, I, you know, I we're that. losing lives. I, I'm not sure why our community isn't further in coming together in our governance issues. I mean, there's big issues here within this community that we need the same type of situation of coming together of building an arena to our people coming together and figuring out this governance and what we're doing to move forward collectively. I think there's, you know, the, that's just part of, you know, the frustration piece on, on my end, but I do agree with Helen as well. You know, I think if this is once and for all that the community, then let's have the referendum and let's, let's settle this issue once and for all because we can't continue to go back and forth uh, on this item and I think you know we can't continue to go back and even look to because I know there was points in there from Mr. Mr. Paulus as well you know that I just don't feel like it, it's an you know an item to you know go back and forth on you know uh, Gaylord's name as well like you know there's there's just so many pieces to this uh, you know, to this situation. And I just really want to move forward in the best way possible. I see a number of hands being raised 
Um, so I'm first going to begin with Brenda uh, and then over to Michael, Lisa, and then Nathan. And then I'm going to draw this uh, to a conclusion and look to next steps here. Brenda, you have the floor. So the next steps that I can see um, bears the question of how, how legitimate was the name change back in the day when a referendum was already in place and a referendum wasn't done to change it. To me, the next step is simply reinstituting that referendum that stands. That referendum has never been challenged. It's never been changed by anyone. You just right the wrongs of the past and say, we made a mistake. The referendum that was done in what year that was that Mike put out there, that stands and that's what we follow. Like it wasn't changed properly. So the referendum of the original name still stands. Thank you. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks for that, Brenda. Over to you, uh, Mike. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm just looking at the uh, resolution. Um, I'm trying to get in the scene here. I'm looking at the resolution that was made by council to put to leave both names on the arena. And what it says in this resolution is that the Gaylord Paulus name will stay on the side of the arena. It doesn't say that the Gaylord Paulus arena name will stay there. So what needs to happen is the arena that, that is under Gaylord Paulus's name should be removed before we do anything else. The resolution just says to leave Gaylord Paulus name, not the Gaylord Paulus arena. And also, there are signs by, at both laneways going to the arena. And on those signs, it says Gaylord Paulus Arena. And that's incorrect. There is no such thing anymore as a Gaylord Paulus Arena. It's the Six Nations Sports and Culture Memorial Center, period. It's, a, it's the arena, our name has been reinstated. And we need all the media. Like I, there's a flyer in the bank in the plaza right now. There's a flyer that says, Vaccinations at the Gaylord Paulus Arena. That's not correct. And I see in the papers constantly, Gaylord Paulus Arena, this, that. There's no such thing as the Gaylord Paulus Arena. We need council to make an announcement or put something in a paper or something, you know, let people know it's the Six Nations Sports and Culture Memorial Center. And then I don't know I don't, if you have another referendum, go ahead. Because uh, I'd be really happy because, yeah, I've been around for three years and you're going to you're going to you're going to see the same results as what I did for three years. I already did our referendum. I already did it. And now we're going to do it again. That's and like like Brenda said, just leave it by the first referendum. Those referendums cost lots of money. Like, you know, at least 40 grand, probably more. Like who has that kind of money to, to, to do on this issue? When I already went around for three years, I can already tell you the results. So I think Mr. Dave General has, wants to say a comment here. I just wanna underscore what, what the chief and Mike have mentioned and that's uh, education. And the reason I mentioned uh, Bread and Cheese Day, it gives us all an opportunity to educate each other. Even though we may disagree on the issue, at least we have the chance to hear each other, to look for, uh, look for uh, resolutions to all of this. So I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, Two Row and uh, Turtle Island and the radio station will, will invite both sides of the, of the discussion to come in and uh, Educate our educate our uh, our citizenry, and the uh, again, and I'm going to kind of thank Mike for doing the, uh, the th three years of work. But there's nothing like having the people have the last word, and that's uh, I, I don't care if you spend a little bit of money doing it. It's their voice. It's their voice. It's their voice. 
Yeah. Okay, now, now, uh, now, uh, Mike, Mike, and Dave, appreciate your your comments as well. Uh, again, I'm going to look to. I have a couple more hands being raised, and I would like to get to next steps as we do have a number of other delegations on the agenda as well. Uh, you know, we give ample time, and that's the goal. Is and and to to Dave's point, you know, it is the people's voice, and that's what we're doing here now is allowing for that voice to to be heard. Now we need to get to a decision in terms of where we're going for next steps. I have Lisa in queue next, and then over to Nathan. There you go. It's nice to see all of you. There you go. Um, it's actually Jen here that's going to talk. She wanted to talk. Okay. Um, say go, everyone. Um, and I just want to uh, commend Mike for, for doing all the work he's done on this for the last three, four years. And an and amazing historic history you gave, Mike. It's, it's, and I was much, much younger when all of this happened. And I can tell you without a doubt how hard the people work to build the arena. And that's including my brother. He worked all day and he went out all night uh, canvassing for, for, for um, you know, for donations uh, for the arena. And I always remember him saying, wow, he said, we finally got arena. We don't have to play on a swamp anymore with a piece of coal. And, and that was great. That was, that was what it was in his mind. And, and I just want to emphasize that the arena was organized with the whole community as a priority by many community members and supported by many community families. And I think that we would, we would really do diligence to our community to give it, to give it its, its proper name that everyone wanted uh, way back then. Nyawa. Okay, Nyawa, Nyawa Jan, for, for your comments as well. Uh, okay, I'm going to now head over okay. to Councillor Nathan Wright. Let me put your mouth Thanks, Chief. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Brenda. Um, thanks to all the, the speakers who have brought forward and, and contributed to this conversation. Um, certainly a, um, a very um, passionate conversation had by all of us. Um, and, and I just want to acknowledge in, in the chat and, and what I was going to base my comments on was there's a lot of older people in this room talking about the future name of uh, a, a, a building that some of us likely won't be using as much in our, in our older years. Um, it's, it's gonna be used by the future generations and more are young people that'll benefit from um, this. And, and I, th I think we have to do our due diligence in terms of ensuring that this conversation does not creep into future generations that we resolve this in a good way. Um, so a few points um, that uh, I would like to see going forward, we're, we're using the word referendum um, quite a bit here. Um, but at the end of the day, um, who's going to be utilizing the, the arena? It's going to be our future athletes and it's going to be our future artists. So really, it's up to them. It's not up to me. You know, you're, you're putting me in a decision making role and, and I'll do my job and I'll do my due diligence on this. But it's, it's not up to me. It's, it's up to those youth. And uh, I look into the chat and the youth that uh, provided his comments on that. That's, that. Those are the individuals that I'm, I'm looking at. Leighton's comments in the chat, those are the ones that are in charge of, of looking at a way to resolve this issue in a good way. Um, so, you know, I, I think we can kind of look at it from that standpoint of let's um, honor all of those roots and all of those individuals that have built that. I actually think there should be, and, and we have enough uh, individuals in our community to make a hall of fame. And, and you know, uh, however we go forward with that, it's not just honoring uh, a few people, it's honoring all of those that have contributed and built, uh, built athletes. 
uh, those that have built artists, um, those that have built the arena um, should be done in a, in a more equitable way um, going forward. I'm, I'm concerned with kind of the back and forth because my fear is next week we'll, we'll get another side and another passionate um, angle to this story um, or the week after. Um, but at the end of the day, let's be honest with ourselves right now. This is for our future generations. And, and from my perspective, it's up to them um, in, in terms of going forward. And, and I, I would really strongly encourage um, everyone around the table today to deeply consider um, honoring not just a few folks, but honoring everyone who's contributed to the building of athletes and, and consider a, a hall of fame as, as a way to compromise going forward. Um, and um, so, yeah, I'll leave my comments there, um, but um, really thank uh, everyone for contributing. Uh, to this conversation and looking forward to a, a, a really good resolution that will, you know, benefit the community and benefit the future generations. Okay, thank you, uh, Nyawa, uh, Nathan, for your comments as well. I know you've had a few uh, pieces in there in terms of next steps. So, uh, you know, I want to, and, and much like our, you know, we don't want to go back and forth on this item any for any longer. I want to see a resolution to this myself as much as, you know, the those who are presenting. So, you know, Nathan had touched on the piece. I know this was mentioned before in the previous conversations when this item had come forward um, is in relation to, you know, a, a potential building of a Hall of Fame here in Six Nations because we, you know, he's right and we all know how many athletes have been, uh, you know, have had much success uh, in the past, present and into the future. And so I think that's something that we should also take a, a look at in relation to this item being brought back. Uh, but I think again, even moving forward, how would, how does council want to proceed? Because I agree, you know, we're, we're kind of now put in this position of, you know, decisions that happened from previous councils that we're still dealing with, you know, so this is going back 2001 or whatever, however many years, you know, 21 years, I think Michael mentioned, uh, you know, in terms of that change, you know, so really just want to be able to focus in on how do we then now settle it so that our athletes aren't impacted by making or choosing a side. You know, I think that's where it's also you looking to the division in this community. It's we're always constantly divided and we don't have to be when we can come to these, this, this, uh, you know, a peaceful resolution in which we, it's been mentioned. So looking to council on how you would like to proceed with this presentation. Uh, again, wanting to get into next steps. Are there any counselors uh, on, oh, I see Helen has her hand raised. Well, I already gave my, my what I wanted to see done. I, I know Mike doesn't agree with the referendum, but I think uh, that's gonna do it. That's the only way it's going to get settled, once and for all. I didn't, when the 2019 council voted to leave the name there, I, I voted against that. So I have been against this from the beginning. I want to change the name back to the Sports and Memorial Cultural Center. I didn't agree with anyone's name being on there, and I didn't agree with it way back when. When the, when the council did that, I didn't agree with it. For the same reason that a lot of people don't, I didn't think we should recognize one person in our community when we have so many other people to recognize. So I'm still supporting a referendum because I think that's the only way it's going to settle it. But Brenda made okay, a good point too, though. She she referenced the, the referendum back back when, and the council Wellington Stance's council that chose to change the name. Um, that was that even legal to do that if a referendum had determined the name? That uh, and I'm kind of thinking along Brenda's lines that it it wasn't legal. I don't think for council to change the name without doing a referendum because the referendum had been done to give the council a name. I think that I think it was anyways. So it's just it's been wrong right from. Things have been going wrong right from when they decided to change the name. They should never have done that. I, I don't know why they did, but and it's not been right since. 
So I think we need to fix it. The only way we're going to fix it, I think, is with the referendum. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Helen, for sharing uh, some of your thoughts in, in getting to a solution to this item. I'm going to now go uh, with Melba, Councillor Melba. Yes, uh, sorry, I missed part of the meeting. Um, the IT, IT department and myself have been working on my phone and my, my uh, other technologies here that is difficult, but at least I didn't uh, miss the whole meeting. So I want to thank uh, uh, Mike for certainly sharing all the history and all the work that's gone into it. And of course, the condolences to one of our pillars that has passed away, Vera Stires of this community. I think we're talking unity and we're talking division here. And in order to respect one another and acknowledge all those who put their heart, souls, sweat, finances forward to build the arena, for the kids, as Mike said, for the kids. And also the adults are taking advantage of that. And Chief, Chief Mark, you had mentioned, I think you mentioned heavy hearts and health problems in our community. We have a lot of crisis. It's, it's just unmanageable at times what council is working with, crisis after crisis. In many of the meetings that we have, we're meeting like 10 hours a day many times with three meetings. So we're, we're just overloaded. So I want to say, let us all use our good minds. Do we all have good minds? And what is that? That's respect, caring, consideration, courtesy, all those nice words that fit into who we are as people. I think we need to settle this issue of the arena, like many people have said. Again, the history, Mike, that was great. And I certainly connected with you, with your emotions. And modeling is very important to our children. They're watching us. How are we gonna settle things? How are we gonna make decisions? So I believe that both names should be left on the arena, but continue calling the arena, the Six Nations Cultural Memorial Center Arena. That is my views on this. I think it's this, it's been disrespectful, as it said, you, we made, uh, we made mistakes, maybe making a, a decision so quickly. And I hope we don't make another mistake tonight because I do believe there's room for everyone, including Gaylord Paulus and the name that so many our people were involved in. Thank you. Okay, thank you now, uh, Melba, for, for your comments as well. So I am hearing, you know, uh, Helen's side, Melba's side on this issue. You know, I want to really, and, and you, you are right, Melba, you know, there's there's ways that, and we, we have to compromise, right? We have to look to that piece of how we're going to move forward in the good way, because you're right, the young people are watching. They've been watching on how we decide and make decisions in this community. You know, it doesn't have to get down to personal or personalities or vendettas or any of those pieces. Let's stick to the facts and let's do this in a good way. That's all I'm saying. And let's focus on some of the bigger issues. If we could come together on an arena name change, then surely we could come together on some other bigger issues in this community. Michelle? I think, um, I think the fact Sorry. that... Uh, can I go? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Michelle. Yes, you have the floor. So the history was a referendum was done to name the arena. That's my understanding, correct? If that is how the arena was named, the council in 01 should have never changed it without doing a referendum. So what Brenda has suggested is actually process and um, accurate that realistically then the name should have never been changed. Yes, agreed. Are you suggesting anything further? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, honestly, then, I mean, those motions don't stand because if a referendum had to be held, then I don't see, I mean, then we're right back to the original. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I have Hazel in queue next in council. I'm not going to spend too much more time on this. I want to move to resolution. We've we've went around in circles. Uh, so I want to look to next steps here. Hazel, you have the floor. Okay. Um, yeah, this has been going on way too long. And, and each time it feels like you're caught between a rock and a hard place because there is a lot of emotion involved in this. Actually, as many years back as they changed that arena name at the time, I felt like, why doesn't somebody um, fight against that? Because it just didn't seem right at the time. But as years pass along, now we're what, about 24 years now, and you just sort of learn to live with what, what is. Um, if there's a referendum, somebody's got to find that referendum. So that would be your, um, well, the council at the time who changed the name should have looked at that. I don't even know the year that it was changed. But nevertheless, if that's what happened, then I guess that would be your precedent setting thing that that precedent um, had to have a referendum done. And if it wasn't done, then that tells you what you got to do. Um, as far as, you know, we have so many athletic uh, people on our reserve who have done great things and I don't like the part where it's almost like you have to um, declassify Gigalord Paulus because he was a good lacrosse player. I find that hard to deal with um, and before and even in our human services committee meetings I've spoken with Cheryl, Bump, or Cheryl Henhawk and I've asked her about considering starting to look into budgeting each year to get a hall of fame for all of the all of the athletes that everybody will get recognized for all their accomplishments and i agree with what dave general said he's he's talking that same language about a, a hall of fame and it would be great if that could be built on the lobby of the arena and I guess what I would like to do, I like the, the original name myself. I really like that because it includes, it says so much, the name itself. But um, as far as actually removing Gaylord's name, I think we should also plan to build a Hall of Fame up there and leave his name where it is only until that is, um, built and ready and then you could start assigning uh, names to whatever uh, areas are contained within the new unit so it's just a suggestion um i'm just trying to think of solutions as we go along here and as melba said it's a it is tough it's hard making these hard decisions when you know like they're the heart of the people are all in it too and somebody's going to feel bad if um the name is taken off or what i personally like the full name that was originally signed i have to go my dog is barking here sorry i thank you uh thank you hazel for so for your comments so what i'm what i'm hearing and again i guess it's my role as the chair to kind of hear uh you know the, the sides because regardless of which you know hearts hearts are going to be broken on either side whatever decision right but we don't i don't think we need to go down the road of you know disrespect of you know to hazel's comments we don't need to go down the road of that we can go down the road of balance and peaceful resolution and uh, to me and i agree with michelle and helen you know when we and brenda rather and when we look at the process of things the first referendum that was done then that that still stands so to me it, what i'm hearing is that the, it should be read it should be maintained the original name but in the same sentence we don't have to disrespect or we don't got to go down the route of of the piece of you know a dis um, you know dishonoring uh, Gaylord's name. However, in that same sentence, let's look to honor all of our athletes with the inclusion, obviously, of Gaylord. So I say, if council's prepared, and, and to be honest, I did agree with Helen and, and and former Chief Dave on the referendum to have 
However, you know, that's that's really unwanted dollars being spent on something that we already know is in place in the first referendum. So at the same sense, you know, I'm trying to balance this out to have a good pathway forward on this item. So what I'm suggesting, and I'm just going to put this out there based upon, uh, you know, the discussion is that we look to the first uh, first referendum, we look to that, that uh, you know, the outcome of that first referendum, which would mean that the original name would maintain at the arena. In the same sentence, we would still look to honor Gaylord in other areas in addition to all of our athletes so that we really put an emphasis on the Hall of Fame. We really put an emphasis that we it could be showcased at the arena, we can build upon, we can look for dollars, we should be spending those refer the potential second referendum dollars on this Hall of Fame. Because Mike's right, it's about 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars to just hold a referendum, which I think is nonsense. I don't think we need to go that route at this point. I think at this time, we'll, I'm going to look to putting this suggestion to council that the name go back after the first referendum, back to the original name, uh, and that in the same motion, look to the Hall of Fame, look to honoring uh, Gaylord uh, Paulus in other areas. And I want to move forward on this issue in a peaceful way, because again, our young people are watching and they'll continue to watch and we should be able to do this peacefully. Helen? Um, I'm just not clear. I think we may have to rescind those other motions that were made. So, but regardless of which, re regardless of which, I think when we, if we can look to uh, our Shirley, you can assist on those pieces to do the homework and the diligence pieces. Right. So that the, the motion true. can, right. So the, if there's a new motion on the floor and pass, that would obviously supersede based upon the previous motion. Well, we can say that it supersedes two previous motions. Exactly. So are you right. willing to put that to the floor? Sure. Okay, it's moved by Helen Miller that the arena go back to, to the original name of the, uh, the Six Nation Sports uh, and Cultural Memorial Center and that we look to other ways to include uh, you know, all athletes across the board at Six Nations and further honoring Gaylord Paulus. In addition, that all and any other motions would supersede at this uh, of this motion being passed. Is there a seconder to that effect? I will. It's Sherry Lynn. I got a. Um, can we add to it? Sure. Second. Yes, second by Sherry Lynn. And further comments. Sherry Lynn, you have the floor. Um, just add to it the referendum date and the date in there. The the referendum. You're talking the about. You're, you're talking about the first referendum, correct? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Can yes, that the, can be added. Date, we'll look. Added. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Is that okay with the mover? Yeah. Just to include the date. Okay, thanks for that. It's been moved and seconded, moved by Helen, second by Sherry Lynn. Are there any further questions or comments? I have a comment. Uh, sure, Helen. Our, uh, I would suggest that we dedicate our next newsletter to the history of all of this as per what Mike has and the, uh, write the history of the arena and all that kinds of stuff so everybody can read it and understand what's going on. I like that suggestion and thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Is there any further questions or comments? Sherry Lynn? I do, it's Melba. I do, it's Melba. Um, yeah, I've never seen the, that uh, uh, referendum oh. that people are talking about. I've never seen it. I don't know the words, what's in that referendum. So I'm, I'm really not going to vote for this because of that. But I do believe that we should all be using, as I said, the good mind. And, and it mentions honoring people. Honoring those people that spent so much time, energy, finances, sweat, tears, work, building that arena for the kids. So I believe both names should stay on it until we do talk about, uh, about honoring athletes. And at that time, there could be another meeting and decide what to do with Gaylord Paulus. But right now, I think it's very disrespectful to say, we want that removed. After all these years, as I said, we make mistakes. We definitely make mistakes. Let's not make another one. But let's, right. let's honor both the community as well as an individual. So use our good money. 
definitely agree. Thank you, Melba. And uh, trust me, I'm definitely looking to continue using a good mind and getting to a solution to this to this matter. It's been floating around for years and years and years. So surely enough, we can come to a solution at this point. I think we've covered off the piece. We don't, there is no disrespect, um, you know, towards the Paulus family at all. We're in fact trying to look to other ways in the compromising of making sure that we still continue to honor Gaylord and his legacy. So to be honest, I think we're trying to balance this out in, in the most honest and fair way. Sherry Lynn. Um, I was just going to say, along with what Helen said in the newsletter, can we, uh, council, pay for it to go into the two papers? Also, let's educate. Let's put it out there. Most, educate most them. definitely. Also, also Tucci, um, I seen Welby Johnson. He was waving. I don't know if he, he's been waving for, for a while. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, my, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> my apologies. Sorry. Thanks for that, Sherry Lynn. My apologies, Welby. Did you have any further comments? Talking to me? Well, yes. this is well. Sorry, sorry, well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. No. I'm okay. the second member of the committee. Vera Stiers was the third. Joe McClure was the first member of the committee. If the original committee members would have known that the name could be changed, they would have never spent another day on a committee. We started that with the idea that we were building it for the community, not one individual in our community. We, we, we wanted to build it for the community, not one individual. And uh, the biggest mistake that, that was ever made by council back then was that they didn't post it. It should have been posted for a few weeks let the people uh, let the people uh, respond to it. That was never done. It was done overnight. The name chain was done overnight. They knew that it was posted. It wouldn't go through. There were so many people in our community that uh, the youth of our community, not for one individual, for the youth of all the families who, who had uh, families. It wasn't built for one person. It was never the intent. I know the original committee would never have, I wouldn't, and they would never serve, continue to build that arena if they knew in time the name would change. We didn't build it for one individual. We built it for the community. <laughs> okay, Joe Mator, thank you. Uh, it was an idea. It was, it was Joe Mator's idea. I just tagged along because that was a good idea. But then eventually, you know, uh, more people thought it was a good idea and, 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 it, and, and, and they come forward and say, yes, let's do it. But we're, we'll build it for the community, not for an, an individual. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm, uh, so thank you. I'm, I'm so, like my emotions are so high because I wouldn't have spent another minute on that committee if I knew the name could be changed. To, 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 no, neither with the original uh, committee. There was only four members. Joe was first, I was the second, Bill was third, and uh, I think Bill, uh, uh, Bill Wade was the third. None of them would have ever served another day if they knew that name would be changed. We build it for that community. We build it for the uh, Six Nation, the youth of Six Nation, not for one individual. I wish I could turn hey, back thank the time. You, well, <laughs> thank you, Welby, for, for your comments. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off or anything, but there is a motion on the floor that is uh, looking to entertain and address this, this solution or, or resolution, rather. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Are there any further questions or comments in relation to the motion? I'd like to, I'd like to hear it, uh, Mark. And I want to thank Welby. Welby, you made some very good points. 
when you said um, it's not made for individuals. Very good points you made and the mistakes that have been made, as I have mentioned, and I'm sure others. And I wish I could have heard all of this tonight. I would have liked to hear Dave General and what he was saying also. So I'd like to hear the resolution, and I'm sure others would too. Okay, thanks, Melba. Uh, Shirley, can you uh, please reread? Uh, re Sorry, no, Shirley's. Shirley, so sorry, just to confirm. Okay, so this is what I have. Um, it's moved by Helen Miller and seconded by Sherry Lynn Hill Pierce that the Six Nations of the Grand River revert the name of the arena back to the Six Nations Sports and Cultural Memorial Center. And that also Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council look at other outlets and other alternatives to honor our athletes from the territory, including the late Gaylord Paulus. And that we also, um, include this in our newsletter. Oh, I know it's Sherry Lynn had mentioned and made the point at the end that she would want, she wants to reference the date of the referendum and in the recommendation. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Thanks for, for reading yes. that, uh, uh, Shirley. Uh, further questions or comments, Helen? Yeah, she tell Shirley, she, Shirley has to put in there that it's superseding the two other motions and find out what the dates were. Perfect. Thanks for that uh, reminder, Helen Shirley, if you can add that in. Uh, and if, oh, thumbs up. Perfect. Thank you. Is there any further questions or comments in relation to the motion that Shirley just read? Okay, seeing or hearing none, then all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. Moved by Helen, seconder. I'll second, Sherry Lynn. Second by Sherry Lynn. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. So that is, uh, we'll, we'll do our next steps. Uh, Michael, thank you for bringing this forward again. Uh, looks like it's now settled. I appreciate everybody who's on the line uh, and who has done the work. I know this has been a tough, tough, uh, you know, uh, subject. However, I I hope that we can learn from this, from from you know, we, we should be able to go back in time to when that arena was built and when all the, everybody came together. Hopefully, we could get that sense of togetherness now because this community needs it even more so now. So, just wanted to have those comments as well. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to everybody on the on the call. Really appreciate everybody sharing uh, their their thoughts and sentiments into this issue. Thank you, everybody. I hope you all all have, are keeping safe and and well. And as well, again, just want to send my sincere condolences to Vera and her family and friends, uh, to the late Vera, as as she was such uh, an amazing pillar to this community. Thank you, and Yawa. Okay, Council, that leads us into our next item on the agenda, uh, which is our delegation, our third delegation. Uh, this, this item has been also coming back and forth in relation to uh, an ethics application. Uh, we've since now, have, I've contacted, Colin is on the line. I know there was questions in relation to this project that he is proposing. Uh, so we had, uh, you know, our next step really is to get Colin here himself, uh, which he is on the line. Uh, to speak to his application and to clarify some of the items. I know Colin also uh, had the opportunity to tune into the council meeting where some of the issues were raised. So he has a good concept uh, on those items of concern. Uh, so at this point in time, I will welcome Colin uh, to the general council meeting this evening uh, and pass the floor over to yourself, Colin, for uh, your quick presentation. I do uh, want to also emphasize the time 
do apologize, Colin, but we do uh, are stretched a little bit for time. So I'm going to give at least a maximum of about 15, 20 minutes to your presentation and for any Q and A's and we'll go from there. So over to you and welcome, Colin. Thanks so much, uh, Chief Mark, and, and no need to apologize at all. Um, I'm just uh, happy to be here, happy to have an opportunity to talk a little bit about the project and uh, hopefully provide the clarification that that, uh, that Council needs um, to uh, provide some more context uh, on their decision behind, uh, behind the project's approval. Uh, so I have uh, prepared a very short presentation. Um, hopefully it'll provide a little bit of a, a review or a summary of the project. And then I was planning on opening uh, up the floor uh, for questions and answers. I have my, uh, my supervisor, Charles, here to, to help, as well as our project partners, uh, uh, Michael Montour, the Director of Public Works, to hopefully provide any, any questions that, that Council does have. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Uh, so uh, the uh, the research the proposed research project is titled Six Nations Wastewater Project Medium Scale Design Performance and Alternatives and uh, project partners from Six Nations Public Works uh, the water operator Steve Lickers uh, Director of Public Works Michael Montour and uh, his, um, Junior Operator Steve Lick Steve Lickers Junior a very uh, brief overview my name is Colin Gibson and I'm a, a PhD student at the University of Guelph. Uh, and, uh, and this research project would make up a, a portion of my uh, PhD project. And, and today I'm here seeking approval for um, the aforementioned uh, project title. A very brief summary of the details of the project. So uh, what is it that we're, we're looking to do? Uh, we'd like to uh, collect some wastewater samples from a few of the uh, public communal medium-sized systems. They're uh, called peat moss systems. And it's to gauge the performance of these systems, primarily for the purposes of, of maintenance and operation. So seeing how they're performing and, uh, and uh, if they need to be uh, uh, maintained. So why, why are we looking to, to, to do this? Uh, I reached out to uh, Steve Lickers and, and Michael Montour early, uh, early in 2021. And, uh, and this project was identified as a, as a research, research interest to public works. Uh, and it would be an opportunity for uh, collaboration as well as uh, mutually beneficial. Uh, how would we uh, would be doing this? Uh, so that would involve uh, uh, students, so me and uh, undergraduate research support, going out to these systems and collecting samples and uh, bringing them back to the McMaster lab to uh, analyze them for uh, water quality parameters. And the, the, um, the equipment that we have in the lab, anything that we were, we're not able to uh, the, the range of uh, um, parameters that we're looking at, anything that we can't do in lab, we're looking to do uh, commercially to provide a, a full suite of, of typical uh, wastewater um, parameters for analysis. Uh, when would we be uh, starting this project? Uh, the project uh, would begin um, following uh, uh, Six Nations elected council approval if, if it was granted approval. Um, what are the benefits of this project? So. Um, I, I wanted to do this uh, project and, and it began just by reaching out to public works, just something that was of, of interest to them that would also um, support my, my PhD research uh, area of interest, which is uh, water systems. Um, and so uh, when we were thinking of this project, we wanted it to be something that would be of benefits to public works. And uh, one primary benefit would be that it would provide information and data about the existing systems, again, for, for maintenance and operations purposes. And the other piece is uh, it, it will provide some insights on emerging technologies for future considerations. So part of the project would involve analysis to compare the existing systems with uh, uh, newer uh, alternative systems, emerging technologies to see um, how they compare. So public works can uh, consider alternatives if these systems need to be replaced when the times come as well for, um, for future developments. And this last slide, uh, just um, touching on a few key points about the project. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this, this research project been directed by uh, Public Works in collaboration uh, with water operators. And we've co-developed the research, uh, received a, a letter of support uh, that was included in the research application. To provide some clarity on the uh, requests, our requests, uh, the researchers' requests from community partners, uh, we're looking for oversight, guidance, direction, support, and feedback as needed um, throughout the course of the project. 
uh, as we're, we're carrying out the um, field research activities, maintaining communication, just letting them know what, um, what, what we're doing, what's been completed, getting feedback as that process carries out, as well as access to any uh, site locations if there's any fences, uh, as well as any uh, relevant background inf uh, information that will help um, with, uh, with the research. Uh, a, a few uh, last keynotes, honorariums would be provided for project partners for all their time, for all their uh, effort and support. Um, we would complete a mem memorandum of understanding before starting just so um, uh, they're aware of, uh, our project partners are aware of, of our expectations of ourselves and responsibilities, um, as well as uh, upholding chapter nine of Tri-Council tri Policy Statement 2 and, uh, and OCAP, uh, Principles of OCAP, ownership, control, access, possession. So all the data that's being collected is for public works and for public works use. Um, the last point is, as I mentioned, this is uh, this research would be part of my, my PhD project. So it would be included in my PhD thesis and, uh, and um, related journal publications. So, so that's a very, uh, there's a brief summary and, and there's, there's more details if there's any questions, but I'd, I'd like to just open up the floor to, um, leave any of the remaining uh, time that I have to for, for questions from counselors, as I know there were some uh, last week and hopefully we can answer, provide some clarification. Thank you so much for, for listening to my presentation. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Col uh, Colin, for, for coming and joining us this, uh, this evening at General Council. If I could ask if you could just uh, uh, remove your share screen. Absolutely, uh, we'll <laughs> sorry about that. No problem. Thank you. Uh, okay, Council. So you've uh, you've heard the presentation. It's been back and forth multiple times. So uh, we have all the necessary people here for any further questions or comments. So I'll first begin with uh, Councillor Michelle. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Colin, for your brief presentation. And so I guess where it was quite convoluted the last two times, um, and you really condense what you've come forward for tonight. So you're strictly asking for permission on the wastewater project. How does that complement the work you're doing with the Anigonos project? Um, and also my understanding was last time we reviewed this, there was an article. So has that article, like this is where it's kind of messy, right? So this is where all the questions arose. So if you can clarify, because you're involved in so much, you're strictly asking for the wastewater project ethics approval this evening, correct? That's right. And, and I'm happy to provide that clarification. I can, I can totally understand um, where the confusions come from. Um, just to, to answer the first question about uh, the article that was submitted. Uh, so that the COVID, that COVID and water paper um, was submitted back in September, 2021 to the ethics committee at the same time that this research uh, project proposal was submitted. Um, but they're, they're uh, part of two separate projects. They just happened to be prepared at the same time. So I'd sent it in. Um, I, I totally see where the confusion can come from, uh, would come from, from that. Um, uh, they, are, uh, they are two separate projects. So for today, I just wanted to focus on, on the wastewater project application. Um, and, uh, and, and that article uh, was a, uh, is, is just a draft paper. It hasn't been circulated or, or submitted or published anywhere. Um, and uh, I was looking for some feedback uh, on um, the, the process for how uh, that uh, paper would get reviewed, um, if, if it would follow the sort of same uh, protocols um, that the, the research uh, application would follow. Just to, just to clarify, and just so I don't cause a similar sort of confusion uh, in the future um, for future um, for papers. And I think, yeah, with respects to the article, there were concerns. And so I think, surely you may want to liaise with Colin to share those, um, or Nathan, I'm not sure, or Melba as chair of ethics. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I just want to comment on that as well. Uh, when we had submitted it uh, in September um, for review, it was a, it was a preliminary draft. Uh, and we were, we were gunning for a September uh, deadline. Um, that, that deadline uh, has since passed. And uh, as I mentioned, it hasn't been um, shared or, or pursued publication anywhere, of course, um, because it uh, hadn't received uh, approval yet. 
Um, so uh, since it, that draft was submitted, there has been opportunity for some of the other off authors to make amendments to it and, and to make some updates. So I know there were some concerns that were mentioned at the last general council meeting, uh, and, uh, and I would um, really um, love the opportunity to address those concerns and, uh, and hopefully uh, some of those concerns already have from uh, the additional re reviewers. So I'm happy to, to talk about that um, review process and how we can make some of those changes. Yeah, if I can jump in here, um, we got a shirt grant for um, uh, at McMaster. It was an internal shirt grant, which is it's pretty. It looks good on students' resume, and I I gave it to Sarah Smith because she was completing her her health studies um, at that time, and it was regarding COVID. Um, and it was just basically what I had suggested is that we celebrate. <laughs> the response that Six Nations had with COVID because, you know, we weren't going to develop any anything surveys. It was just, a, you know, we're getting painted in a certain way out in the academic world. And I had, you know, said to Colin, why don't you work with Sarah and, and develop, you know, a, a snapshot of how well this community organized themselves to respond to COVID because that that is a best practice that should be noted. Um, so that's where it came from. So not everything is a Oniganos. There's a lot of grants that fly around for students. And then secondly, you know, it's hard because Colin does work for Oniganos, but he 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 wanted to work with the community to find out what their needs were before he designed his own PhD program. I'm not on that committee. Um, so I know it gets really confusing for everybody involved because there's so many moving parts with students. There's the Oniganos ethics, and then some. In some cases, not all. You know, they have a separate project, but it's still informed by. And we're kind of overseeing or just keep. You know, saying why don't you ask Mike what what they need and and do that for your project. Do a meaningful PhD. So it came from a really good place. I just think uh, it got confused with a lot of other things. Um, ethics is generally confusing. We, we have seven ap ethic applications. Uh, I'm hoping Mark, you'll be able to sort some of that out because there's three at McMaster and then several <laughs> with Akwesasne in here and Lubukan. It's, it's almost oppressive where you can't get your research done because you, you gotta go through so many hoops bureaucratically. But I think it was done from a, a good place. He just wanted to do his project that was meaningful to Six Nations, but we're not funding it. So that's the I think so. difference. Yeah. Thanks, 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 thanks for that, Don. Colin, I want to go and uh, I, I see Councillor Nathan has his hand raised, and I do. I you know we've talked about this piece. I know Don. We have uh, yet to uh, connect on this so that we can really just tie this all into the bigger picture of things mm -hmm. and that's something that we're working on as well i know obviously with you know the uh you know with mcmaster and so forth so you know there once we do have that sit down and be able to then lay it all out so that it is more clear uh for full yeah. council then i think that will be more beneficial because people will uh, ultimately understand the bigger picture of where we're heading uh over to you nathan yeah thanks chief and, and thanks for the clarification colin it's it's clear in my head now after seeing the presentation where you were going and, and what you intend to do by way of um the academic side of things um and uh, and i think just to underscore uh chief hill yours and, and dr don martin's um kind of commentary around that bigger picture and, and seeing that i think as we go forward um one of the things I would recommend, not for the immediate, but as, as we further think about um, building our environment unit, <clears throat> as we further think about the research that's being done, that we start creating these research agendas to help keep us coordinated um, in, in a lot of ways. And, and, and I think that's a, a responsibility at our end too for ethics. Um, to look at uh, where we have gaps in research, um, to look at future research and, and what that agenda looks like and how that matches up with um, 
the work um, that uh, our, our researchers are coming in and asking um, going forward. So there is that clarity at the end of the day. Um, and, and, and really, uh, and, and I think just to pick up on a, a term that you use, Dr. Don, it's, it's you know, meaningful research uh, at the end of the day, because we want all of the research that comes through Six Nations ethics to be meaningful to our community. And, yeah. and uh, for, um, you know, not to lay blame on anybody in the past, but, you know, the, the research really hasn't, um, you know, resulted in us getting final presentations, final data, and, and storing that data and using it for future purposes. Uh, so I'll just kind of leave my comments there uh, and, and just express that I really appreciate the clarity um, and uh, that uh, I agree uh, we've got some work to do in terms of formulating what our future research agenda looks like. Can I just respond quickly? We, we, we are willing to do webinars with yourselves to present the, the research findings to the community. I think we discussed that several times, but COVID and everything else. So our team is, is organizing to do that. Um, at any time, we're willing to partner and, and hopefully lay out how we're trying to do research that is beneficial to the community. Um, but it would take several webinars, otherwise people would really want to shoot me. Um, so we're willing to do that and, and ready to go whenever uh, you think it's, you know, the best time to host a, a webinar, uh, Facebook, whatever you want, so people can ask us questions. We'd more than welcome that. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Don. Are there any further questions or comments from Council for any of the individuals on the line? Okay, seeing or hearing, oh, I'm sorry, Michelle, I see you go off mute. I'll move Collins Ethics app. Okay, thanks for that, Michelle. It's moved by Councilor Michelle. Is there a seconder? Yeah, I'll second. Second by Councilor Nathan. Thank you for that. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. Moved by Michelle, seconder. Second by Nathan, all in favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Okay, Colin, well, thank you so much again for, for coming and joining us this evening and, and further clarifying some of these uh, concerns and points being raised. I don't, Don, we will work uh, in the next, uh, I, there's so much things happening in both of our worlds and everyone's world, really. Uh, yeah. But uh, we will look to schedule uh, into then, you know, tie in these all in and how it all relates to the bigger picture of things. So really appreciate uh, that as well. That being said, I just wanna say thank you, Nyawa, and have a great evening. Thank you so much, everyone, for your for your time, and I really do apologize for all the confusion. <laughs> Thanks again. Uh, all good. Thank you, Colin. Take care. Bye bye. See you, Don. Um, okay, uh, Council. That leads us into our last delegation of the evening, uh, which is from uh, our president at the Six Nations Development Corporation, Matt Jamison, in relation to the Lake Erie Connector Project. Uh, is Matt on the line? Sorry, Shirley, if you can just confirm. Every, everybody doesn't have to jump at once. <laughs> Shirley, uh, if you could just confirm if Matt is in the waiting room. Okay, I see him connecting now. Thank you for that, Shirley, appreciate that. Uh, good evening uh, and welcome to General Counsel, Matt. Uh, we have you next on our, our delegation. Uh, so uh, with that being said, I know there's obviously the necessary documents within your Dropbox. So I'm gonna pass the floor right over to yourself, Matt, uh, to walk us through uh, this portion of the delegation. Oh, sorry, I did see him on the line. Maybe he was having some connectivity issues. Uh, 
There he is connecting to audio again. Apologies to our community. Okay, there Hi. he is. Good evening, Matt. Hi, good evening. Sorry about that. I have technical difficulties here. <clears throat> yeah, no, no problem, Matt. I'm just going to pass the floor right over to yourself to walk us through the next item. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm pretty sure the council has uh, the briefing note along with the package of materials uh, that we had sent uh, last week. So the, the agenda item is the, the Lake Erie Connector uh, project, which is something that has been circling uh, our community for many, many years. Uh, and so essentially, just as a bit of a backgrounder, I know the council is aware of this. Um, in um, October of 2021, so last fall, uh, we came to the council to seek a renewed mandate to explore the Lake Erie Power Connector project to see what was in fact uh, the opportunity for our community to participate. And at that time, council had given us a mandate to go and work with a company called ITC, who is the developer of the Lake Erie Power Connector. And, and effectively, uh, over the last several months since October, we have been working with ITC to flesh out what those options would be for the community. Um, so, you know, the, the briefing not really speaks to this in, in great detail. Uh, and essentially what, what we're here tonight for is to update the council and to seek approval from the council to proceed with uh, entering into a term sheet, which would allow the project to be shared with the community through a uh, community investment review process, which is outlined in the briefing note. So I know last year there was a number of, a number of discussions with the council, and I think there's a lot of sensitivity around how do we effectively you know, reach out to the community for these types of projects. I also know that there's lots of work to be done and I know the council has it on their agenda to look at ways in which we can enhance community consultation opportunities into the future. Uh, this project, uh, the ITC Lake Erie Connector is in fact time constrained. And so what we've done is we've put together a work plan, if you will, that includes uh, our due diligence that would run in tandem with a community consultation piece. And so as part of that due diligence, we have already had our legal counsel review the term sheet, which is, which is presented in the package. We have engaged an environmental consulting firm called Megan Burnside, who are an indigenous owned environmental um, consulting company who are professionals in that space. We have engaged um, Dylan Consulting to draft and develop the community consultation piece that we'll use for the investment review. That, over, that, that uh, summary is also included in the package. And we have also uh, engaged a financial advisor, First Canadian Property Investments, to do a preliminary assessment of the project economics associated with Six Nations participation in the project. Now, all of that work is being done to equip us, the council, the community, with the, with the requisite information to make a decision on whether or not we want to participate in this project. Essentially, the term sheet sets out really three choices for, for, the, for the community, for the council moving forward. The first choice is to participate in the project as an equity owner. And equity means that we would be an, an investor and an owner of seven and a half percent of the, of the uh, transmission line. The other option is to a participation payment, which is, a, which is very much like a royalty payment where we receive an annual royalty stipend and the project you know, continues to operate as a going concern without our ownership. And the last option is not to, not to participate at all. Uh, so there, there's really three choices and it's very preliminary at this point to, to lean towards one. What we're, what we're suggesting is that we kick off uh, almost immediately after the council, assuming the council approves the term sheet, our community outreach process uh, following the, the proposal that Dylan has put together for us. Uh, and just for everybody who's listening, the Lake Erie Power Connector is a, a 1,000 megawatt high voltage direct current um, power cable that will connect Ontario to Pennsylvania. And it involves uh, putting uh, the, the, the transmission cable, uh, connecting it from Nanticoke under Lake Erie over to Pennsylvania. 
there have been many, many projects like this that have uh, laid electrical systems under lakes in Ontario and Canada. So it's not new technology. In fact, there's hundreds of these types of deployments, but it's new for us and it's, uh, and it's our, in our backyard, so to speak. And so we've been working with ITC on the project for many, many months um, to better understand uh, what the opportunities are, what the risks are, and frankly, to build out a, uh, an outreach plan for the community so we can educate people on what it really means for them. Maybe I'll stop there, Chief, for a second to see if there's any questions. And I can go in, in more detail on each of the options if you'd like, or I can talk more high level around what our next steps might be. Okay, perfect. Thank you, uh, Matt, for, for laying that out. I just want to look to any further questions or comments at this point. I see Michelle has her hand raised. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Matt. And I'm not sure that community is, you know, we, we read the materials, but I think it would have been better if we would have showed actually some of the briefing note on the screen. And so for me, I, I have a couple questions. So if I understand this correctly, you're looking to engage community the first step, right? By us signing the term sheet, that's exactly it. Does the community want to move forward with this? That's correct. I mean, the goal of the term sheet is to enter into an understanding with ITC so that we can move forward and socialize this opportunity to the community. And, and if it helps, Michelle, I do have a, a few slides that we can share uh, to provide sort of an overview of what the project is uh, so people can better understand it if you wish we could show that. I think that would be good because as you've seen, we had um, an hour presentation earlier and community was engaged. Community wants to know. And as yeah. a council, we want to be transparent. So I think it makes a lot of sense to share as much information as you can and also um, obtain feedback from community. Sure. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. Thanks for that, Michelle. So if I can, I know I do see recognize Helen and Nathan. If I can just maybe go over to Matt first, just to lay out a quick uh, presentation on more in depth on this project, and then I'll go back to the speaking list and start with Helen back over to Nathan. Okay. Okay, Matt. If I can, just pass it back over to you, just to walk us through a more uh, just more in depth on this uh, on this project. Yeah, I'll try and share my screen here. I think I can do this. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Yep, yeah. okay. So this is just a few slides, just to sort of very high level about the project. Um, so what is the project? As I mentioned earlier, uh, it's, a, it's a high voltage direct current power line that connects Ontario to Pennsylvania. There are really two parties. The party in Ontario is the IESO, which is the independent electricity systems operator in Ontario. And for all intents and purposes, they are the customer for the Canadian portion of the project. And then on the other side of the lake, of course, you've got the United States and there's a US entity down there uh, known as PGM. And they are effectively the counterpart for the Ontario electro electrical systems operator. And so they would be the customer on the US side. And, it's, and, what, and what happens, it's a bi-directional transmission line so that when when there's periods where Ontario needs power, it will draw power out of the United States and vice versa. When Ontario has an abundance or extra power, it will and can sell that power into the United States. The thing that's important to consider is that without this asset, there is a tremendous amount of waste in the electrical system. And it, as we know, the Nanticoke area was a host to a, a large coal generating station and there's thousands of megawatts of power capacity on that Niagara transmission, or, sorry, the Nanticoke transmission corridor that's underutilized. And so rather than have Ontario on the grid go and build new transmission assets to chop down trees somewhere else, we've got this transmission corridor that's underutilized. And this, this uh, Lake Erie connector is effectively an asset to help monetize the existing infrastructure that we already have. Uh, and um, you know, use it to its highest and best use before we go and build other assets. So that's really one of the one of the real value adds for the power connector for the Ontario Systems Grid. So an overview, I've sort of just talked about this. It's a, it's a, an AC cable will be connected to the grid 
on the Ontario side, it'll be converted to direct current. And then that high voltage direct current line will connect uh, um, Nandy Coke with uh, Pennsylvania. It's about a 104 kilometer transmission line, about half of which is in Canada and the other half is in the United States. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, it is, uh, it's a very safe and, and reliable technology. It's been used for decades and almost 200 installations worldwide. So we're not talking about technology here that, that hasn't been used before. As part of this whole process, uh, ITC has gone through the National Energy Board and uh, a number of agencies in order to get the requisite permits in order to actually construct the line. Uh, we are now looking as part of our due diligence, conducting a review of all of those permits to make sure that they were completed to a high standard they are in fact uh, meeting all of the mitigation measures that were articulated in those studies. And uh, that's really what Negan Burnside, our environmental uh, engineering company is looking at. So the location of the project, you can see, uh, it's a fairly small footprint, fairly close to the lake. And it's right down here. I don't know if you can see my mouse or not. Uh, and it's right beside the old Nanny Coke generating station, which is everybody knows is now decommissioned. And the plan is to run plan is to run the line down uh, um, Haldeman Road 55 into the lake, uh, but it will be a buried line and it will be in the right of way under Haldeman Road 55. It's also important to note that the line itself will not touch the edge of the lake. It's actually directional drilled and emerges out in the lake. But part of our studies through Negan Burnside is to assess impacts on the environment, wildlife, and any other ecological considerations that we might have. Uh, so what are the benefits? Uh, so ITC engaged you know, independent engineers to assess the economics. One of the main drivers is uh, ratepayer savings, and that affects all the households here in our own community. Uh, you know, there, it's estimated over $100 million of net benefit to the Ontario ratepayers, of which every household in Six Nations as a Hydro One customer is a ratepayer. So there will be ratepayer savings associated with the line. It's not going to show up in perhaps dollars, but maybe in cents somewhere on your hydro bill moving forward. The other thing I think that's important to note is the environmental attributes. Uh, you know, carbon emissions reductions by two to three million tons a year. And, and you know, I think that, uh, it's, although it's not really mentioned here, I spoke about it earlier, we've got this transmission corridor that's underutilized. And for me, uh, I would rather utilize all of the tools we have in the electrical system before we go as a society building other things. And so I think this is one way we can monetize that existing transmission line. And of course there's jobs and economic benefits. And as an equity, as an equity investor or owner of the project, there are considerable uh, revenue streams that will flow to our community uh, upwards of $45 million over the next 40 years and potentially a lot more than that. Um, but all of those numbers would be socialized through our community outreach, our investment review with the community to share what those economics are, what it means for the community. But I think part of the narrative here is really explaining why this is needed. And that's part of the, the, the mission of information sharing with the community so that they understand why it's important, why it's needed, what's the value associated with the environmental aspects and the value associated with our community. I'll stop sharing here and Stop for questions, Chief. Okay, thanks, Matt, for, for providing uh, more detail on this project. I know there's lots of questions uh, circulating, uh, uh, for those who are community members who are watching uh, online. The first one is, you know, what are the environmental impacts of this? I know you touched a little bit on that piece. And as well, you've also touched on what is, what is the benefits to our community? So I know you've also touched on those pieces, but if you can just maybe reiterating those uh, pieces, one, the environmental impacts and two, the benefits of this project to our community. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll start on the benefits to the community because that's where it's the first order of business on the briefing note. So the benefits of the community are really economics. Um, you know, of course, we've, we've carved out some commitments from ITC to utilize our employees and contractors where, where we have the capacity and capability to do so. And that's, and that's good. And we typically do that in all of our in all of our arrangements. Um, uh, but then there's the two options I mentioned, the, the equity as an investor into the project and the returns associated with that. As an equity investor, uh, within, you know, over the course of 40 years, we can generate a net 
net cash flow, so net profit that would flow to the community of about $45 million over the next 40 years. And th this asset lives far beyond 40 years. It could potentially go as high as 90 million, depending on contract negotiations with the province. So that's the equity option if we are an owner. And the, and the interesting thing is, as an equity owner, you own a percentage of the transmission line. So which means at some point in the future, if it gets sold, we would have an ownership stake in that line when it is sold. The other option, as I mentioned earlier, is the royalty option where we are a recipient of what they call participation payments. It's like rent, essentially. And the participation payments are, are lower than the equity option. They're expected to range somewhere between 30 and $40 million over the next 40 years, growing to potentially as high as, uh, I do think it was like uh, as high as 55 million over you know, 55 years, but there's no certainty around that. Uh, the, the challenge with the royalty option is if it, the asset gets sold, we're not a party to the ownership structure, so we wouldn't be a beneficiary of any of the asset sales. Uh, and then the last option, as I mentioned, was the choice not to participate. And the choice not to participate uh, means that, you know, we forego any of the economic benefits that would flow to the community through equity or through royalty. The other element that's considered in the agreement is something called community benefit payments. And so ITC has committed that in the event that the council proceeds with the project or agrees to be a party to the community benefits agreement, which effectively means that the council will support the project, that there will be an additional revenue stream that will flow to the council uh, in an order of magnitude of about a million dollars over the course of the first three years uh, during construction. And then once the project is operational at COD, it'll, they will pay approximately $120,000 a year for 40 years uh, in, in consideration for the support that the council will lend to the project. So. As I mentioned, the benefits to the community are largely economic. Uh, we do have a provision to pro potentially provide employment and contracting services. It's not a carve out, but it is a commitment. I think it's a, a, I think it's a bona fide commitment from ITC to, to utilize our labor force. We have the capacity to do so. Um, and, and really for us, it's about how do, we, how do we clearly lay that out in a way so that we can identify any risks and concerns the community might have, which leads me to your next question, I think, Chief, it was around the environmental considerations, right? And so we do have a comprehensive due diligence process uh, that we've identified. And as I mentioned, there is a legal review where our lawyers have already looked at the term sheet. They've already looked at, you know, uh, our capacity funding arrangements and things of that nature. We've had um, council's lawyer at Blake's review uh, the Schedule A uh, support terms for the council in the event that there's a community benefit agreement and they've got they've got no concerns with the language that's proposed in the term sheet and we have we've done a preliminary financial review as i mentioned and those numbers that i had cited to you are from an independent consultant who has evaluated the financial model that was prepared by itc so it's not something that was developed by us it's a it's an independent evaluation and uh, the environmental piece as i mentioned we've we've retained a negan burnside who are an indigenous environmental consulting firm. Uh, and you know, the scope of work for them is to assess uh, the cumulative effects of the development, uh, the fish uh, and wildlife habitat, any impacts of wa uh, water quality, environmental management, air and noise impacts, uh, any land habit uh, habitat enhancements or any cultural or archeology span impacts as well. So. Uh, Lonnie's group over in the Lands and Resources Department were involved uh, between 2014 and 2018, I think it was, on some of the archaeology work that took place. And so uh, Negan Burnside is engaged with Lonnie's staff. We are, and they are looking through the archaeology reports to make sure that any mitigation requirements that were identified uh, by that archaeology work are captured and dealt with as part of the development as it moves forward. So. Uh, that would be the, the you know my response to the environmental uh, question. We're looking at it from a, from multiple angles, not just land based, but habitat based in the water, in the lake, water quality, noise, and all those other aspects, and then the cumulative effects of all of those things together. What does it mean? Uh, and we'll ultimately have a report from Negan Burnside that will ar clearly articulate any of the mitigation or concerns that we might have, and, and recommendations to mitigate moving forward. Uh, I think it's a very, very robust approach for uh, 
uh, assessing the environmental considerations with the project. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we have retained Dylan Consulting to frame out and, um, and lead our community outreach process as an independent body. Historically, the Development Corporation or our staff have taken on that responsibility and it's challenging. Uh, but now with Dylan Consulting, I, we, we believe that that level of objectivity will, will you know, stimulate additional conversations that may not have had, happened in the past. And they will be a, a, you know, an objective voice to, to gather and synthesize the feedback from the community into a report uh, that will, will help inform the final decision uh, that will be brought back to the council to be, to be made. So just to be clear, the Development Corporation is, uh, was appointed uh, to sort of be the lead uh, negotiator to advance the project. We are not the decision maker. We are uh, negotiating and putting things in, in, in uh, language in, in a way that's understandable and can be shared with the community in a logical format so that we can educate the people about what it means. Uh, and then ultimately a recommendation will come back to the council from the development corporation to either proceed with an, an equity or a royalty option uh, but ultimately the, dis the decision is the council's to, to, to choose between equity, the royalty, or not to participate at all. That's not the development corporation's uh, decision to make. Okay, Matt, uh, thank you. So uh, thank you so much for laying that out so diligently and eloquently. I just want to acknowledge uh, two guests that have joined us, Sherry Brandt and Doug Motley as part of the delegation. Just wanted to acknowledge you, you two, and thank you uh, for joining us this evening. I'm gonna go now to any further questions and comments from council. I know I, sorry, I do see Nathan has his hand raised. Uh, so I'll, I'll first begin uh, actually with Helen first. Helen had hers first and I'll go over to Nathan uh, and then we'll go from there. So Helen, you have the floor. Oh, sorry. She's go ahead, Nathan. She's waving you on. I think I believe, Nathan, you have the floor. Thanks, Chief, and and thanks, Matt, for the presentation. Um, you you actually answered my question, but it prompted another question in my head. Um, in terms of the first question around the advantages of using the existing line and enhancing it, I'm wondering if you can illuminate a little bit more. On, on how that's also um, an advantage to um, us as owners of the line that we're not creating new lines. And, and um, that environmental uh, impact would be a negative if we were creating a new corridor and a new line, but we're actually just using the existing line and enhancing it um, going forward as well. Um, uh, and, and kind of how that will translate into the benefits on, on the um, economic side for us. So that was the first question. The second question is, do we have kind of a time frame? Because I went right to Dylan's consulting and council knows my love for communications. Um, I went right to their work plan and, and you know, I, I think it's a great work plan um, in, in terms of how they've set out the methodology. The only thing I was wondering is, is what, what's their time frame to get a lot of that work done? Um, I, I just want to make sure we're giving uh, enough time for the community to digest the information. We're not just doing one-off kind of workshops and then leave that issue and go on to the next. I just, I just want to make sure we're doing our due diligence to uh, take our time with um, the community engagement to come up with those decisions. Okay, I'll, I'll just take a shot at that as best I can. So just to be just to be clear, and thanks, Nathan. So just to be clear, the the transmission corridor in question is the the Nanticoke transmission corridor, uh, and we don't have an ownership position in that. We have an ownership position in the Niagara reinforcement transmission line. Um, so, from an economic standpoint, um, there isn't a real direct tie to the transmission corridor in Nanticoke. But the way these assets work is really the customer in question is the IESO, and they pay a fee. In this case, they'll pay a fee to the Lake Erie Connector project. And in exchange for that fee, they have the, the ability to use that transmission line at their discretion. Uh, when I spoke about the transmission line that connects the Lake Erie Connector, which is the Nanticoke Transmission Corridor, that's got thousands of megawatts of idle capacity that's not utilized. 
And so if I'm the, I'm the kind of person who always wants to maximize the utility of the things that we already have before we build new things. And, and so I look at that transmission corridor and I see, you know, Nanny Coke, and it's an area where, they, where there was already, you know, an industrial presence. That area in my mind should be host to lots of types of assets that we can utilize that transmission corridor before the province goes and builds new transmission corridors in other areas. Uh, because as you mentioned, that means other environmental impacts, you know, chopping down trees and things of that nature. So those things are things that we'd like to avoid, obviously. Uh, and, and, you know, not doing that and, and maximizing the utility of the things that we already have and providing a mechanism to distribute power back and forth from another jurisdiction makes a higher and better use of the assets that we do have. So as a, as a wind farm investor, uh, Six Nations, we own a number of wind farms down in that area. There's something that, that's called curtailment. And effectively what that means is when the wind blows and the wind turbines are turning, sometimes the power that's generated from those wind turbines isn't needed in the power grid. And so you're generating this power and, and uh, the, the ratepayers are effectively paying for it. And that's what really has given renewable energy a bad name. Wind farms are producing power, that power is being paid for, but, but not being utilized or otherwise wasted. Uh, and, and, and so we need assets to help you know, utilize those, that, those electrons in ways that are meaningful. And so the connector project will enable us to take that power, that excess power, and sell it off into Pennsylvania and other, and other users in that direction. And in, you know, in the times where we're, we are in, uh, you know, there's more demand than supply in Ontario, it gives an avenue to enhance the reliability for Ontario to stabilize the power grid to meet the demands of our, of our citizens here. So if there's a multiple bottom line value set associated with the project, uh, not the least of which is it will help uh, create additional values for the wind and renewable energy assets that we have now. Uh, and it will, I think, uh, if you fast forward in time, prove out the value of further renewables being added into the province, which means further greenhouse gas reductions, which means further, further utilization of the existing transmission assets that we already have, uh, and avoiding running gas plants in Ontario, which, which, which you may know gas plants lead to tremendous greenhouse gas production. So uh, there's you know, multiple values of streams there uh, of, of consideration, Nathan. With respect to Dylan's proposal, I think Nicole is on the phone. Uh, Nicole Kahoku, who works for us, is leading up um, the, the community outreach process with Dylan. And Nicole, maybe I could just ask you to give us a quick update on your conversations with them. I know you guys have been having extensive meetings. And maybe you can just share uh, what that plan looks like. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, so I've been in discussions with Dylan, um, pending the council approval on the term sheet, we plan to launch community engagement um, starting March 1st and run it for a 60 day period until the end of April. Um, because of the COVID situation, we're looking at doing webinar sessions. There'll be probably one or two sessions every week that they will be hosting. Um, they're planning targeted outreach as well to all the organizations within Six Nations, um, inviting them to participate in the process or lunch and learns. Um, there is gonna be outreach to the HCCC. Um, yeah, and so we're just developing, passing over project materials to them right now, and they're assisting in the collateral development. And depending on the decision tonight, um, we will be busy getting into um, advertising and things like that with Dylan. So we're, so we're actively actively engaged right now with Dylan in anticipation of launching this by March 1st. And so our teams have been working together as well as ITC, uh, readying ourselves to, to kick this off. So it won't be it won't be a rushed exercise, I can assure you that. It will be very it will be a very calm and well planned and well thought out uh, delivery uh, with a message that that you know can really be translated so people can understand what it means for them. And that is an important piece for us is to explain this, the, some of the things I just talked about. Like, why is it important for this to be part of the Ontario energy system? Why does that, why does it matter um, to utilize the Nanny Coke transmission corridor to mitigate further development? I think that all is part of the narrative that we need to share. 
Hey, thanks, uh, thanks, Mac, Matt, and Nicole for for sharing that. I know that's a key piece, you know, for for community uh, is to to know what that engagement looks like. So I really appreciate Nicole you sharing and shedding some light on that item. Um, and, you know, and I think at the end of the day too is we what is is uh, collected right from from the engagement obviously is going to play a big role in the decision this council has to make you know so that's part of the i think in terms of how we further build trust uh in transparency and accountability is just by doing what we're doing now you know having this first step being very open to you know the intentions of this project with our community what that looks like but at the end of the day it's it's always um, you know, a little bit frustrating because regardless of which, we know we have governance issues in this community. Unfortunately, a lot of the times we can go and do as much engagement as we want and know all the facts about the a, a specific project. However, at the end of the day, it comes down to, well, you know, we're not supporting it at all just because it's Dev Corporate Council doing it. You know, so that, like that's where I think we need to also kind of get into, you know, our, our our community where we can you know get to everybody and hear everybody's thoughts on this piece because that's a really important you know they're big projects and the other piece of this too is you know we have to look at own source revenue generation you know that it, it like we, we there's no more if ands or buts we can't sit and wait for Ontario and Canada to continuously look on how they're going to fund this and fund that you know we need to get strategic and we need to be you know ahead of the game and start to work on what those own source revenue uh, you know, situations look like. And so I really think that is an important piece, Nicole, that you laid out in terms of how we're engaging this community, what that looks like, what it means after the engagement is finished, you know, so that at the end of the day, we have all of these, these pieces to make a good, well-informed decision. And I think that's, that's the most important piece as we move forward. I see Michelle had her hand raised. Yes. Okay. So thanks. Um, a couple questions. So first one, Nicole. So it was an RFP process and Dylan was selected. That's correct, right? We didn't do an RFP process, no. And how come? Uh, we, we've been working with Dylan on a few other proposals. So um, we just contacted them to sole source them. Thanks for that insight. So I'm just trying to understand. So this is coming to council tonight. Um, for their approval on the community consultation, or maybe I shouldn't use that word, but um, it's my understanding though that they have, you've already signed the mutual confidentiality agreement that's in our briefing note, right? But that's, that's correct. Matt, did you not just say you don't have the authority? So it's coming to council. So I'm I'm confused. We don't have the we don't have the authority to make a decision for the community. But so the mutual confidentiality agreement, all it does is it provides a mechanism so that we can get disclosure of information so that we can run our analysis and due diligence. We're not, we're not, there's no, there's no binding nature to the confidentiality agreement to make a decision one way or the other. But, you know, it would be, it's critical for us to have access to, the, you know, the, the, the key documents in order to run our due diligence. Without those key documents, we couldn't present a meaningful presentation of the community. So we needed to enter into a confidentiality agreement or something we do a lot with uh, potential developers and non-disclosure agreement types type of uh, structures. So, and we also enter, entered into a capacity funding agreement, which is also in the briefing note, which is the mechanism through which uh, we receive funding from ITC to pay for our independent due diligence, our legal advice and our financial advice. Uh, but that that relationship is a, is a relationship that we retain the advice we pay and we ultimately recover that expense from ITC as part of their commitment to advance our participation in the project if the council chooses to do so. Okay, yeah, and I understand like the council, the community actually has has input. Um, yeah. I think they do because when I look at that piece in the briefing note that says, well, the MC binds um, disclosure of confidential information for five years, to me, that would say then we can't disclose to community. Yeah, but it, it does go on to say that we're collaborating with ITC to make to ensure that we that we get uh, so disclosure. What does sufficient mean, I guess. Sorry. What does sufficient information mean? Well, uh, I can tell you this: we we are asking for everything. <laughs> so we want to see all the key documents, all the financial metrics, all the environmental studies. 
uh, and and you know I think that where it comes down to the collaboration on disclosure, we do speak with ITC on the extent to which we we will disclose information publicly. But for us, we we expect to be everything as part of our due diligence process. What gets disclosed uh, publicly may be may be um, filtered, but ultimately, it's our responsibility to make sure we get to the root cause or the root facts. That's what we do. Okay. So then, my final comment then is: What is our liability, our risks in doing this? Right now, there's no binding nature for us to sign. Like on the term sheet, there's nothing binding to the term sheet. There's nothing binding to the to the MCA other than the confidentiality for five years, and then there's nothing binding on the capacity funding agreement. So at this point, there is virtually no risk for us to pursue this opportunity with the community. We can go through the entire community uh, investment review process. It can come back to the council, and if the council decides that it doesn't want to participate. Uh, and chooses not to, um, there is, they're not bound to, uh, to do anything. And the costs incurred are costs that are incurred by the development corporation in part for our time and, and the funding provided by ITC. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Matt, for that. I know I have Shiri Lynn uh, in queue next, but just before then, uh, you know, I think the, the other piece that uh, what I see would be beneficial is you know, for some of the questions that and comments Michelle has raised uh, is in relation to, you know, what to the average community member, you know, it, it, you don't necessarily know, you know, what does the term sheet mean? What does the confidentiality agreement mean? Like there's different steps to a business proposition or business uh, opportunity that is just, that's, that's standard business, right? So I think that might be even beneficial when we talk about community engagement is looking at to see, you know, like if a, if a type of project like this comes forward at a community, what is the, what is the, the steps that need to be taken in order to get to this point? Once we're at this point and then it's, we're getting to a community engagement and to, to council and so forth, then we now are at the next step, you know? So I think that might be beneficial as well is when we talk about these types of projects and maybe act dev or so forth, you know, can maybe have a community uh, webinar or something to at least, and not on a specific project, but to lay out, you know, the, the different steps of what it all means of a term sheet, what it means for com confidentiality agreements. You know, there's things that obviously we, that just are, we are, you know, can't share at times unless or until we sign a formal agreement and look to that partnership and what that looks like. So uh, just a, a note on some of the things in terms of what Michelle has raised. I think that might be beneficial even further when we get into more of these types of projects. Sorry, Matt, did you just, did you want to say anything to that? No, uh, no I, I agree. I think that, you know, part of part of what we're doing in, in, in absence of having, you know, a full rebuild of our community consultation model that I know that we've talked about working with the council to do in the future. Uh, yeah, I mean, the more information that we can shed on these things, the better. And, you know, we can put a slide in the, in the community presentation that we're building right now to explain what the sequencing is and why and what they mean. I think that's, you know, yeah. I take it for granted because that's the world I live in all the time. Um, so yeah, we can definitely right. do that. Uh, but, you know, I think ultimately as a community, uh, we need to revisit the whole process. And as I think I mentioned before, the development corporation, we don't want to be the author of that process. What we want to do is we want to follow that process and whatever standards that the community dictates, we'll follow. Uh, but in the absence of right. that, we do the best that we can. Right? Exactly. And I think, you know, even further to that, the other, the others, you know, flip side of the coin is we can't just continue to say no, 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 and, and deny projects like these types, because then how does that win then now work for the benefits of our community moving forward when we talk about own source revenue and all those pieces, right? So I think that's where when we, if we can build upon what you're saying, you know, we can get more support and look to even further, you know, getting the opposition. If there's opposition to a project, well, we want to figure out why they're opposed to it. And if there's anything further that we could assist in making sure that, you know, they have the necessary factual information in order to make an informed decision. Uh, Sherry Lynn? Mark, it's Hazel. Um, just a couple things. I won't repeat a lot what everybody said. So, so tonight you, we're just deciding to take it out to the community and let the community decide out of the three options, right? Yep. It's, yeah, uh, okay. The primary, the primary recommendation is to uh, authorize the chief to sign the term sheet, right? That's, yep. the, the, that's the first recommendation. Then the second one is 
to authorize the development corporation to, to undertake the community investment review as outlined in the Dillon report that's attached to the package. Right. And that will come back to, to us, to the management team at the development corporation. We'll, fi we'll finalize a report that will go through our board and then come to the council for the final decision with all of the input we've received from the community. Right. And they're paying for everything, the consultation to the, or whatever you want to call it, to the community, right? That's correct. Okay. So my other thing is I'm sitting here reading this option. I'm just saying if it's, if we go to ownership, my question is, are they going to be giving reports, um, environmental reports yearly or, and also um, if the ownership is quarterly reports or yearly reports, because I see as the option two, we're just going to be sit, you know, just collecting the money. But as an owner, you want to know what's going on. So I, I guess that's my question is um, if that's uh, the decision for equity ownership. So the, so the difference between the equity ownership and the royalty structure is, you know, as an equity owner, we are an owner of the assets. So the one way to think about it is if it ever gets sold, we would be entitled to our No, I'm not asking that. Sale. I understand that. I'm not asking that. I understand that. I'm asking, is it, are we going to have environmental reports if we own it, like as an owner, as a yearly, the environment's changing. So are we going to have environment um, assessments yearly given to us so we know what's going on? And the other question I had is, if we do that one as an owner, are we going to have reports and know what's happening um, with it? If it's quarterly or yearly, are we going to be in the loop? If that's the decision people make, say, I'm just asking, is that going to be part of it? So as an, as an equity investor in all of the things that we've done already as an equity investor, we do get at a minimum quarterly performance reports, financial reports on how the asset is producing. And that's captured in our annual audit, as well as our management discussion and analysis paper that we prepare every year. So there's a scorecard on all of our assets and how they're producing. And that's shared with the community through that document. As it relates to the annual environmental reporting, we got we have Doug on from ITC. I don't know, Doug, if you have any comments on whether or not that's something that would be included in a reporting package. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good question. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for letting me join and and uh, and listen in. Um, it's a good it's a good question, Councillor. I don't know. Um, maybe Shri understand or uh, remembers what the requirements are. That's certainly something we could talk about, right? And that may be part of the community engagement process. An engagement with council is just if if that's important, uh, then then incorporating that in the agreement, right? Um, you know, it, it is important to remember too that you know we're not we're not moving, you know, gas or oil. There's nothing to spill, um, so it, it's a fairly benign project. Um, but understand, you know, <laughs> things can happen anywhere, right? So understand the concern. Yeah, and I think the thing I would just quickly add, Sherry Lynn, so there will be there will be uh, monitoring and reporting that is connected to the certificate that the project has from the Canada Energy Regulator. And so whatever those requirements are, certainly they can be shared with partners. And that's a request. And that's something that, you know, if you come in as, as a limited partner, um, that's something that can be discussed and, you know, we can make note of that as a takeaway, but there'll be, I, I would think the, the, the obvious piece is to have the same type of reporting that we're sending into the other regulators and, you know, would be happy to share information on it as needed. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Doug and Sherry for, for your responses on that uh, question. I'm going to go over to now Hazel had her hand up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a question in regards to um, the part where Matt said that um, Ontario can draw from the Pennsylvania um, line and um, we can draw from them as needed. Um, how do they regulate the cost with a difference in, in funding for each um, country? Does does Ontario have to pay more when they draw from Pennsylvania? Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I will say that our customer is the IESO, and so they pay us 
an annual fee, which is like a standby fee. And then you know, they manage the line. So I don't know, Doug or Sheree, if you want to comment on the cost structure of what they would pay. Sure. It's, I mean, there has been a lot of, it's a good question. Um, there's a lot, there has been a lot of study on economic benefits of the line. And that is one of the benefits, right? Is uh, Ontario has done many procurements of wind and and gas and, and uh, nuclear power and so forth. And there's there's quite a bit of renewable non-emitting power uh, to the south, right? So it's it's generally priced very competitively. It's a, it is a competitive market though, so you can't control it, uh, but you do know that you're getting the best price you can. And, that, and frankly, that's one of the benefits of Ontario is to, to have access to a competitive market uh, rather than just you know, having to contract for things, you know, that, that there's a limited number of, of parties that, that can participate in. Did that answer your question or is that helpful at all? Yeah, sort of. Well, <laughs> oh, well yeah. I was just gonna add, if I can quickly, like I think the point that Matt's raising too is, is key, right? The project itself will have what's called an availability payment. So a fixed payment, an annual payment, so the project has cost certainty in terms of its revenues. And then the risk is really back on to the province, ISO, who is in the business of energy regulation and trading and all of that on a day-to-day -day basis to go and maximize its original purchase price and defray that cost mm -hmm. by selling power into the other markets um, and reducing some of its losses. So maybe that helps too. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for those responses as well. Is there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none then, there is uh, recommendations uh, on the agenda. So the first one, which has been laid out um, in terms of the term sheet, uh, to further offer, I authorize myself to, to sign that. The second one is in relation uh, to the undertake a community investment review process uh, as further captured in the Dillon consulting proposal uh, commencing month, March 1st and concluding on April 30th. And the third one is for second reading to be waived. So I'm looking at this point in time, if there's no further questions or comments uh, on recommendation four, uh, 4D1, is there a mover or seconder to that effect? Moved by Helen, seconder. I'll second Mark, it's Hazel. Second by Hazel. I'll now look to any further questions or comments in relation to the motion. Okay, seeing or hearing none then, I will go to a vote, all in favor. In favor. Any opposed? I do. And can I have that recorded? Okay, one, one is opposed. Um, Michelle Bombery would like her name recorded as opposition. The motion is carried. I'm gonna move now to the second uh, recommendation, 4D2. Is there a mover and seconder to that effect? Moved by Helen, seconder. I'll second, it's Melba. Second by Melba. Are there any further questions or comments in relation to that motion? Okay, seeing or hearing none then, all in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Me. One opposed, Michelle Bobbery, Councilor Michelle, uh, motion is carried. I'll now look to the third recommendation, which is second reading to be waived. Looking to a mover and seconder to that effect. Moved by Helen. Seconder. I'll second Hazel. I'll, second it, Melba. I'll go with Hazel. Uh, seconded by Hazel. Thanks, Melba. Are there any further questions or comments in relation to second reading? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? One opposed, uh, Michelle Bombery, motion is carried. Okay, Matt uh, and Doug and Sherry, Nicole, all those on the line, thank you for joining us this evening. Just want to check in with Matt. Is there anything further on your end? No, I appreciate the time. Thanks, Council. 
Thanks, okay, well, everybody. Thank you so much. I hope you all stay safe. Yes. Take care. Nice take to see care. you. Yeah, and take care. Okay, Council, we're going to continue moving on with our agenda that does complete our portion of delegations, uh, which leads us into our next item, which is the adoption of the General Council minutes of January 25th. I'll move. Sherry Lynn. Moved by Sherry Lynn. Seconder. Second by Helen. Are there any questions, comments in relation to the minutes? Okay, seeing or hearing none then, all in favor? Mm -hmm. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. The next item on our agenda is in relation to recommendations from the Human Services Committee. I have recommendation 6A. move on that recommendation. I'll second. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Melba and Hazel. And just really quickly that it reads that the Human Services Committee recommends to the Six Nations the Grand River elected council to have various staff and council register and participate in the seven sessions related to poverty arranged by the National Council on Poverty beginning February 8th through March 1st. That's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or comments? Michelle? Just the question is, why is that here for us to approve? Is that not administration? It's an administration issue, I would say so, yes. And that can be documented, but I, I think it was just brought forward more or less for council's participation on that piece. Helen? Yeah, I was kind of thinking along the same thing. So we're making a motion that staff have to take this training? Is it a term the workshops or something? Is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, I think they're various. It's various why, staff, obviously, why, depending their have... availability in council to register and participate. Oh, why does council have I'll to make a for staff to take a workshop? <laughs> They don't have to do that. Actually, this isn't totally administration. I'm going to look to the, I see Sherry Lynn, members of the Human Services Committee. Sherry Lynn? So what happened was, um, if you read number two, there's a letter um, informing the, the participants of Six Nations. Again, the government's putting this on. We don't want to be considered as a consultation or anything, but sitting there as for information and giving, and giving input into the poverty on um, First Nations. That's what it's about. It's not about um, session, like for, you know, to learn, it's input that you have on these different se sessions. And I'm not sure if what counselor wants to go there. I have no problem doing it if no other counselor wants to. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Sherry Lynn. Are there any further questions or comments? I would probably do it too, Matt, uh, Mark. Okay, so what I'll do then, uh, we'll look to if this um, a motion is, is passed, I'll look to work with Tammy uh, out of the chief's office and we'll collect any counselors to then look to see who needs to be registered for which session. Are there any further questions or comments? Michelle? I would just say then, Sherry Lynn, based on that, 6A doesn't need to move forward, but 6B should be Okay, well, again, it's, it's, it's not an entirely big issue. I think we've had a long enough agenda with bigger issues, so we can look to the administration. I don't mind deferring this item and, and working with the necessary administration people to do so. However, I do, do still feel the need to, uh, like Michelle has laid out, uh, look to the recommendation 6B so that it's not cons uh, construed with consultation. So looking just to the mover and seconder. Uh, if that's okay, if we withdraw this piece as it is technically an administration issue. Uh, however, we will work with the counselors that would like to attend through the chief's office and get them registered. If that's okay with the mover and seconder. Looking to Melba and Hazel, if that's okay to withdraw this item. However, we would still follow up with it on the admin side. That's fine, as long as they certainly make it clear that it's not consultation. This letter would have did that. Yeah. Right. No, 
no so we're not we're not speaking to that recommendation we're speaking to the first recommendation so we're still going to move forward on the, the second resolution i'm just speaking in relation to the first one yeah i just wanted to say on poverty i don't think we've concentrated on poverty in our community we talk about it but we don't really fully understand uh, thoroughly i guess how it impacts our children in school for example our uh, our uh, food, our intake, our health, our transportation. It just covers many, many things poverty does and certainly impinges realities that uh, should never be in our community concerning our well-being. De definitely agree. So again, it's just an administrative issue on the first item. <laughs> All I'm looking to do is to withdraw the first item. And we would look to the second recommendation and get that passed because that's not going to be misconstrued with consultation. Is that okay with the mover and seconder, just to confirm? <laughs> Again, it's Melbourne Hazel. Can, can I ask a question? Yes. I don't know why you want to sure. take it out. <laughs> I again the top to be honest it shouldn't have even been on the agenda because it is an administration issue however the second piece of the portion of what we're talking about that is a political issue and we can definitely look to make sure that those who are attending makes makes it clear that it's not to be misconstrued with consultation this isn't a big issue council further question comments melba yeah i wanted to say uh, you have an agenda review team don't you Yes. That looks at what, yeah. So I don't understand how these things come on then, if if we have to handle it here. Yeah. I, well, there's some things that obviously are missed. This is one of those things. Apologize. Okay. Nathan. Thank you. Sorry, Nathan. Yeah, I see you have your hand up. Uh, just a comment after you get to the vote. I'll let you get to the vote and then just a comment on this afterwards. Okay, sounds good. So I, I am going to look to then the withdrawing of the first motion as it is an administrative issue to those counselors who would like to attend this poverty sessions. We'll work with the chief's office to get you registered. I will, however, go to the next motion, 6B, uh, which will need a new mover and seconder, which just states to include a letter that those who are attending these and participating it's not to be taken as consultation. Is there a mover in replacement of Councillor Audrey? I'll move, Melba. Moved by Melba. Seconder, still okay, Hazel? Yeah, but uh, I don't understand. Like You're saying this is um, administrative. When Sherry explained to you that it was, this is sent out by the government and it came to our committee and we handled it, and the reason that it came here was for council to know about it because other councillors might want to attend and then to have the letter accompany it. So there again, back in committee, at the committee level, if, if they seen fit to send it there, um, this happens too many times where some discussion occurs in a committee meeting and then when it gets to gets to full council, it gets taken off the agenda. Like Melba already asked a question, you have a, an agenda committee and um, perhaps if they don't think it should be, it should go back to the uh, chairperson of the committee to inform them that that'll have to be dealt with in another way. That's my so view. Yeah, I, I definitely hear you, what you're saying. And Sherilyn did speak to what was uh, in the rec recommendation, the resolution, which we're, we're voting on now. So it's been moved and seconded to accompany those letters to those who are participating. The only thing that we're changing is because, yes, it is an administrative issue to those staff who are interested in participating. We don't need to get a motion uh, you know, to council. If council is prepared to, uh, then counselors, specific counselors are prepared to attend this session. Uh, then we will look to work to make sure that this letter still is accompanied to all the participants. It was just, again, an oversight. And it's, I don't know why, again, it's not a big, big deal. Uh, it's an oversight from the agenda review team. And we'll look to make sure that we're tightened more on when preparing these agendas. Is there any further questions or comments in relation to recommendation 
6B, which we have a mover, Melba, and a seconder, Hazel, on. Questions, comments? I do, yeah. He's just going to leave uh, 6B, and I think he, you need to ask and say, Oh, it needs to be included the poverty, whatever it's called, poverty um, presentation. Thanks for that, Melba. We can definitely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we can definitely include that in the relation to poverty. Any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. A motion to waive second reading. Waive, Melba. Moved by second. Melba, seconder. I'll second. Second by yeah. Hazel. Thank you. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, back over to you, Nathan. Yeah, it's just um, some due diligence on this particular matter. Um, there is a great meeting on Thursday evening. Um, as I view them as kind of the subject matter experts on this, I just want to take it over, make sure they're aware, make sure they're sending some staff as well. Um, uh, because again, they they do this on a daily basis. Definitely. And thanks for that. Thanks for that, Nathan. And also we'll check in uh, with Darren to relay this message. Obviously, our directors obviously know which key staff should also be involved in this piece uh, and to share along this motion that was just passed as well in terms of the letter of any participants who are registering for this uh, these series. Chief uh, Arliss has already volunteered to be the coordinator for registrations. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Darren and Arliss. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, Council, that leads us into scheduling. Uh, obviously, we are in General Council this evening. We have building an infrastructure tomorrow at 9, following the next week into Corporate Emergency Services, uh, as well as uh, Family Day. We'll look to a, a rescheduling. We, we had a reschedule a meeting there. Uh, the nuclear waste strategy, as mentioned on the, on the, in the beginning of the meeting, we'll look to bring this back uh, further in a full package in relation to the Iroquois caucus. Uh, so that being said, then I will lead to the new business item, uh, Michelle. Okay, so I, I think we've all heard and discussed this yesterday um, in regards to there is a rumor in the community that we're turning into a municipality. So I wanted to quash the rumor um, and also maybe let's educate community on there's process, right? And actually we just seen it earlier this evening. I, I mean, this is why we are supposed to be following the processes laid out and you know declaring conflicts because things happen and so i mean tonight we we cleared up something that's been festering in the community for a number of years so i give it over to you the chief to um i don't know where the rumor came from but um if you can speak to it yeah totally thanks uh appreciate uh you bringing this item forward because to be honest it is it's getting quite tiring and i'm sure other counselors uh feel the same uh, you know, when we talk about where we're going as a community, we're definitely not going down a municipality lane. I mean, as much as there's so much happening in our community uh, in relation to trying to, uh, you know, look to different items. I know there's been a lot of work happening, like through Nathan's, uh, you know, the Environment Committee and trying to work on some of the issues there. We have illegal dumping, like there's just a number of items and issues uh, that this community has to deal with, but that doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to be turning into a municipality in order to do this work. I think the other piece too is we need to figure out once and for all this governance uh, and what that looks like. It's an integrated model. I don't know. I don't. We no, not one person needs or knows that answer ra uh, rather, but we need to figure that out collectively. Um, and so, but I think the other part of things too, just to clear things. You know, when, we've, when we suspended our own uh, alert system to our COVID response, I think that was also maybe part of this is when we, we aligned with the province. That doesn't mean that we're listening or going through, or it's basically a part of our COVID response. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of confusion, uh, you know, when our alert system would conflict with the provincial guidelines, obviously we know that COVID is an ever-changing environment. Uh, and we're doing our best here at Six Nations to make sure that we're responding in, in way uh, you know, that we can, uh, you know, have a minimal confusion so that we can still continue to protect uh, the health and safety of everyone involved. So, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm unsure of, of where this uh, rumor has come from. I think it's been a rumor 
floating around for for years uh, rather um, and what that looks like I know there was even I talked to uh, Michelle about this item as well you know even the title of of this role you know no matter who's in the chief's position um, you know they regardless of which they're they're always kind of uh, perceived as you know wanting to turn in or doing something uh, outside of you know what the mandate of the chief's role is so I think regardless of which you know we should talk about even the title of chief you know that's been something that this community has you know brought up a, a few times on different occasions uh, you know obviously we have our and have the utmost respect for our hereditary chiefs and the confederacy council and so forth uh, you know so maybe that's title changing this role uh, i don't know but regardless of which we need to definitely all uh, be on board as a community and where we're going in terms of our next steps here uh, but I can assure you that we are not going down municipality lane. Uh, and in fact, to that, uh, we did speak, and I believe we passed a motion yesterday so that we can make a clear statement on that uh, in terms of you know where we're heading. Uh, and so that's um, that's basically what we're going to do. But I also will need to lay out our plan of action for the next 20 months. We have 20 months remaining to this term. Politically, where are we going on issues? And that's something that we you know want to be able to share with community. Uh, so that we, you know, there should be no surprises in the next 20 months. You know, people will know exactly the work and we can provide status updates as to each of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, so those are some of the things that are in progress and we will be making a statement uh, to Michelle, to exactly to your point in, in terms of quashing uh, this rumor uh, and really looking to see how we could further even engage uh, with community on, the, on, this, um, on our governance because that's ultimately what it leads down to. Is there any further questions or comments? I, I just want to comment that I think uh, we have to do a lot better in communicating to community because, um, you know, people, we, we are federal, right? And, and people understand that. But we also do receive provincial dollars. That doesn't mean we're following the province. We're not adapting or adopting um that structure so there are various things that happen in the community and so i just want to say that yeah, education is key and i hope by having open these meetings open to community um community has learned more about what council deals with in the last two years most definitely and you're right uh, michelle you know the education communication is key and that's something that you know we've been trying to work on even more diligently, especially in these last two years, to make sure that we can, or that community knows, uh, you know, what what we are doing, what the plans are, what the impacts are, the benefits, everything in which we've heard uh, this evening on some of the different um, presentations. So, nonetheless, though, we will be making that statement uh, and hopefully be able to attach, you know, the world roadmap and work plan politically as to what all we plan to accomplish and what you know, we plan to look to uh, while finishing the next 20 months of this term. Okay, is there any further questions or comments? And just to reiterate to Michelle's point, you know, just because we're following a provincial restrictions on COVID does not mean we're adapting or adopting to a municipality. So no, we are not turning into a municipality. That being said, that's all I have on the open session of the, our, our council agenda. Uh, there is no, I think we've dealt with new business. Michelle was the only one. We removed the Iroquois caucus nuclear. We'll bring back that package to full council uh, on that item. So uh, that leads me to the next item, which is the adjournment. Is there a mover and seconder to adjourn? Moved by Sherry Lynn, seconded by Michelle. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Thank you to everybody for joining us this evening at general council. Uh, looking forward to our next meeting live with our full community. Take care and stay safe.